Democrat groups are outspending Republicans for the election by five times as much. Meanwhile, Trump just raised a historic $50 million. Where does that leave the state of the race? The Justice Department rejects House panel requests for audio of President Biden's interviews from his classified documents probe. Oversight Chair James Comer reacts. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell gets behind an effort to force the divestment of TikTok. He's demanding Congress take action, calling the app a threat to national security. Some House Republicans are urging Speaker Johnson to bring up a $95 billion Ukraine aid bill after weeks of stalling. Accusations of Russian interference are starting to fly. We hear a testimony about the Department of Defense budget for 2025 and the future defense program. Find out more from the Senate Armed Services Committee. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Hi, I'm David Lamb, sitting in for Chris Beers. To begin the show, some of President Biden's recorded audio interviews are being protected. The interviews come from his classified records probe. The Department of Justice has refused a House Republican's request to hear them. An assistant attorney general said all information has already been provided including certain transcribed interviews. Special counsel Robert Herr said Biden cooperated with his investigation and decided not to charge him for taking classified documents after leaving the vice presidency in 2017. Herr said a jury would likely not convict Biden, who would present himself as an elderly man with poor memory. House Oversight Chair James Comer reacted, pledging continued efforts from House panels to get the information. Comer stated Americans demand transparency from leaders, not obstruction. He promised a response to the Justice Department soon. House Republicans have threatened to hold Attorney General Merrick Garland in contempt if the department doesn't hand over all the records they seek. An update in the Hunter Biden tax evasion case. The judge has ruled there were problems in Biden's request to submit more material to support his arguments to dismiss the case. The judge says the, the first son's approach had multiple shortcomings in addition to submitting the filing late. Those include failing to schedule a hearing for the motion, not outlining the legal standard, and failing to justify the need for supplemental material. The judge also says Hunter Biden had the chance to present arguments during a three-hour hearing but failed to do so adequately. Ultimately, the judge stated that submitting further materials would not change the decision to deny the motions. Hunter Biden's legal team had previously submitted eight motions to dismiss, arguing political pressure and immunity from a previous plea deal. They were all rejected. And next up, Trump raised a historic $50.5 million over the weekend at a fundraiser held at Mar-a-Lago. This is double the amount Biden raised at a star-studded fundraiser held in New York City at the end of last month. Aside from campaign funds, Biden is also getting a boost from Democratic outside groups, many of which obscure where the funds come from. These groups are outspending Republicans $800 million to $160 million, according to a new Epic Times report. Joining me now to discuss all of this is Dan McMillan, the founder and executive director of Save Democracy in America, a nonpartisan organization dedicated to campaign campaign finance reform. Dan, welcome. Uh, to begin with, the discrepancy in this latest report is stunning. Could you explain the mechanisms that created this kind of scenario in in uh, you know campaign funding on both sides of the aisle? Why is this happening in your view? Well, it's happening because the Supreme Court has removed pretty much all possible restrictions on campaign donations and campaign spending. And across the last three cycles, especially both parties have just gotten more and more brazen um, and just uh, flouting whatever that there are. Uh, what we're seeing in that report, you know, is that is a, is at this point at any rate, a, uh, that the Democrats have a much bigger war chest in outside groups, mostly super PACs. Um, about 800,000 versus 160,000 on the Republican side, as the article reports. 
uh, 165,000, I'm sorry, 1,800 million versus 160 million. About 165 million is dark money that comes from groups that do not identify their donors. That does also lean somewhat Democrat, a little bit more is uh, going to the Democrats than to Republicans. That's been kind of a consistent pattern that Democrats have been benefiting at least somewhat more from, from dark money than Republicans. Um, but the long and the short of it is that um, really at this point in Washington, the only people that have any influence are heavy donors of various kinds. Uh, we, the people, are out in the cold and we're not even allowed to know who's giving the money. Yeah, so what um, is, what's the importance of that? It does seem quite ominous and yet it's allowed to, to happen. So what's, what's the real issue at, at hand here? Well, I mean, what's just so horrifying is that um, unknown people are, are donating unknown amounts of money behind the scenes with the goal of influencing policy. The candidates uh, and parties that benefit from these donations know exactly whom they have to thank for this money, but we don't know. I would also mention that that 165 million reported dark money, um, you know, contributions doesn't tell us the total amount of dark money. Um, already in 2022, we were seeing a, a pattern of groups purchasing political ads and not reporting these media buys to the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, because the the loopholes are. Uh, are so there's so many loopholes. For example, digital advertising, pretty much as long as you don't say explicitly vote for this candidate or vote for that candidate, but instead just attack a candidate or support, you don't even have to report that ad spending to the Federal Election Commission. And so we don't know how much, it could easily be many hundreds of millions of dollars of dark money is being spent. And we won't even know how much, much less who it comes from. Right, and we did see in that Epic Times report one of the large uh, groups does is dedicated just to uh, attacks on others, others opposing the Democrats. Um, so that is something worth paying attention to. In terms of the gap itself in, in funding for the campaigns, what's the significance of that and how can Republicans even the score, would you say? Well, I think that it's, you know, it's... Uh, there, you know, the, what, what happened in the Republican primary was that the larger part of the party's heavy donors, you could call it the U.S. Chamber of Commerce wing of the Republican Party, they put their chips first on Ron DeSantis and then on Nikki Haley. They hoped for a Republican candidate, but not Donald Trump. Um, but once Trump has effectively, you know, clinched the nomination, those donors are now falling, falling in line behind him. Uh, is it possible that some will remain holdouts and sort of be never Trump Republicans all the way down to the end? That's impossible to predict. I'm, I'm skeptical. I still think most of these donors <clears throat> partly will much prefer President Trump uh, over any Democrat. Uh, and the other point is that even with a substantial funding disparity, President Trump has an advantage that's distinctive to him, and that is his ability to get free media, as we call it, or earned media. That is right. to say that he gets, you know, for example, in 2016, Hillary Clinton outraised and outspent him three to one, but he got, we estimate, a billion dollars. Okay. And so, uh, in know, some sense, it's good television. It's not all about yeah. the money. So, that's an interesting it's, note to it's finish It's almost on. entirely about the money, but. Yeah. Not not 100 percent always. Right. All right. Well, thank you very much for this. Dan McMillan, founder and executive director of Save Democracy in America. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Coming up, a Louisiana bill aiming to protect women and girls from sexual assault and harassment passes its first hurdle. What critics of the bill are saying and what's next? Paying high school students nearly fifteen hundred dollars each to become racial and social justice activists. More on a controversial California program. I'm Richard Karn, and I love my hose. It ain't those old hoses. This is my hose. The new Pocket Hose Copper Bullet, now infused with real copper, so your water is always clean and lead-free. 
Just turn on the water and watch your hose grow and grow. And when you turn off the water, away it goes. Our new inner tube uses three layers of high strength latex on the inside. Then it's wrapped in a new polymer filament jacket, three times stronger than the other hoses. But my favorite part of our new hose build, the oversized, easy to grip fittings. Get the super light 25 foot pocket hose copper bullet today for only $29.99. But wait, call now and get our copper spray nozzle with our exclusive thumb drive free. This is an exclusive release of our newest pocket hose. Order now. Call 1-800-960-8919. That's 1-800-960-8919. Or visit copperbullethose.com. Order now. Hi, I'm Susan Lucci. I never thought about heart disease until I had my own heart event. I had heard many times that heart disease is the number one killer. It went in one ear and out the other, frankly. I never had a health issue. I felt this slight pressure in my chest, just slight. But a few days later, while shopping at a boutique, that pressure returned much stronger. By the time I got to the ER, the doctor decided to give me a CAT scan. He said, I don't think you understand. You are on the verge of a heart attack. I had a 90% blockage in my main artery and a 75% blockage in the adjacent artery. I received two stents in my arteries, stents developed for research funded by the American Heart Association. Those stents saved my life. That's why I'm in front of you today, asking you to join me in supporting the American Heart Association by becoming a monthly donor. Call now or go to helpheart.org. For only $19 a month, just 63 cents a day, your support now can help save your life or the life of someone you love. With you by our side, together we'll keep fighting this battle. Give $19 a month with your credit card and we'll send you this special t-shirt that you can wear to show that you are helping save lives. I'm so grateful to the American Heart Association. Their research helped save my life. Put yourself on your to-do list. It could be the most important thing you ever do. Please, listen to your heart. The only reason I'm here today is because I did. So please call the number on your screen or go to helpheart.org now. Join me as a monthly donor today and help save even more lives. Thank you. Join us on NTD Good Morning because we want you to stay informed. Kickstart your morning with the latest you missed overnight. Right, and don't forget that inspiration. Absolutely, so let's shine some light on the good news too. Tune in every weekday morning to NTD News. An update on the Israel-Hamas war. CIA Director Bill Burns made a new U.S. proposal for a hostage and ceasefire deal in Cairo. Negotiations with leaders of the U.S., Israel, Qatar, and Egypt have been going on for months. The U.S. proposal reportedly calls for the exchange of more Palestinian prisoners than previous negotiations. Meanwhile, the Biden administration is warning Israel about its planned military offensive in the crowded city of Rafah as Israel's Prime Minister declares a date for an operation is set. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has the latest on negotiations. An anonymous diplomat and other sources told multiple outlets the U.S. proposal made in Cairo over the weekend calls for the exchange of 900 Palestinian prisoners, many with life sentences. In past negotiations, the number was around 700. Hamas would have to release around 40 hostages in the first phase of a three-stage, six-week ceasefire deal. The anonymous diplomat said the U.S. proposal asks that civilians sheltering in the south be given unrestricted access back into northern Gaza. He said Israel insists on security inspections for people moving north, a sticking point in talks. Mediators have been trying for months to broker a deal. A Qatari representative told the BBC he was optimistic on the state of talks. Without giving details, he said the proposal bridges the gap, but was far from the last stretch of talks. An Egyptian state media citing a senior Egyptian source said Hamas and Qatar delegations left Cairo Monday after all parties agreed on basic points to return in two days to agree on terms of a final agreement. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said Monday he was up to date on negotiations and declared he'd set a date to send troops into Rafah. 
Today I received a detailed report on the talks in Cairo. We are constantly working to achieve our goals, primarily the release of all our hostages and achieving a complete victory over Hamas. This victory requires entry into Rafah and the elimination of the terrorist battalions there. It will happen. There is a date. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller says the U.S. has told Israel it believes a full-scale operation in Rafah would have an enormously harmful effect on civilians and ultimately hurt Israel's security. We have made clear to them that we think that there is a better way to achieve what is a legitimate goal, which is to uh, degrade and dismantle and defeat the Hamas battalions that still remain in Rafah. Around 1.4 million Palestinians are sheltering in the border city with Egypt. Miller says over 300 aid trucks entered Gaza on Sunday, the highest number in a single day since the war began. He says the daily number needs to continue to grow and be sustained. Our hope is that by later this week, 350 trucks will enter Gaza each day, and we are working hard across the United States government to make that happen. We also welcome the announcement by the, that the IDF is establishing a coordination unit, unit for deconfliction as a direct contact point with the humanitarian community. The Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry says over 33,000 Gazans have died since the war started. It doesn't differentiate combatants. The terrorist group took over 250 hostages in its October 7th attack. Officials say roughly 130 remain captive and believe around 100 to still be alive. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. There's a growing call from Republicans in Congress to pass billions of dollars in aid for Ukraine. House Speaker Mike Johnson has so far given no indication of any plans to vote on President Biden's $95 billion request. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo issued a public letter to Johnson yesterday urging him to bring up the bill in the House. The bill passed in the Senate with 70 percent of the vote, but it's been stalled for weeks in the House. Some Republicans have made claims of foreign interference. Among them, House Foreign Affairs Committee Chair Michael McCall and House Intelligence Committee Chair Mike Turner. They accuse opponents of Ukraine aid of being influenced by Russian propaganda. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky, meanwhile, says Ukraine will lose the war if the U.S. does not approve military aid. And Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is backing efforts to force TikTok's divestment from its Chinese regime-linked parent company. The Republican leader says it's urgent that a bill is passed to take one of Beijing's favorite tools of espionage off the table. McConnell says TikTok is a national security threat with an algorithm that pours gasoline on alarming trends. He pledged his support for common sense bipartisan steps. The House voted overwhelmingly last month to give TikTok's owner ByteDance about six months to divest its U.S. assets or face a ban in U.S. app stores. Other bills are being floated in the Senate that would address the Chinese-owned app, including one from Senator Josh Hawley for an outright ban. Hawley welcomed McConnell's support, but said he thinks the chances are less than 50-50 that a strong bill would make it to a vote. Senator Hawley says his bill to ban the app sends a message to communist China that Congress cannot be bought. Potential scandals in the Coast Guard. A congressional inquiry found Coast Guard leadership illegally used non-disclosure agreements to prevent sexual abuse victims from reporting alleged abuse. The inquiry focused on sexual misconduct at the prestigious Coast Guard Academy. Texas Senator Ted Cruz is a ranking member of the committee that looked into the Coast Guard's actions. He spoke out about the findings in a letter to the head of the Coast Guard, Admiral Linda Fagan. And he said that the use of NDAs appeared to be part of a years-long effort to hide information about sexual assault at the academy. The Coast Guard said the agreements were not meant to silence victims. A statement said the NDAs were used to protect the integrity of the investigation and protect victims' and witnesses' privacy. A Louisiana bill called the Women's Safety Protection Act advanced out of a state house committee yesterday. The bill would limit the use of restrooms, locker rooms, and sleeping quarters to men or women. It would not allow exceptions for people who say they identify as another gender. The bill would apply to facilities including public schools, jails, and domestic violence shelters. Opponents say the bill would put those who identify as another gender at increased risk of harassment. Supporters of the measure say it was created to protect women and girls from sexual assault and harassment. The bill passed out of a bipartisan House committee without objection. It will now head to the Republican-dominated House floor next week for debate. 
and a major policy change in college women's sports. The National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics has banned men who identify as women from competing in women's sports. The NAIA represents mostly smaller colleges with around 83,000 athletes at 250 schools. The NCAA has around 500,000 athletes at over 1,000 member schools. The new policy says only female student athletes may participate in its women's sports events. Any eligible athlete may participate in men's sports. The vote by the association's Council of Presidents was 20 to 0. Women's rights activists Sir Riley Gaines uh, are calling on the NCAA to follow suit. Virginia's Lieutenant Governor Winsome Earl Sears wrote, Common sense prevails today. It's more than time for the NCAA to do the same. Republican lawmakers in New York State are now going against so-called squatters. They've introduced a bill that would make it easier for landlords to remove people occupying their property without permission. The New York bill is similar to a law recently passed in Florida. It would shift the burden of proof from the owner to the person occupying the residence. The squatter would have to prove they have the right to be on the property. Right now, any person who's occupying a New York property for more than 30 days is considered a tenant, even if they never signed a lease or paid rent. The bill would change that to 45 days. And a California activist group is paying high school students $1,400 each to become racial and social justice activists. That's according to contracts between the group and the Long Beach Unified School District. The school district used nearly $2 million in taxpayer funds from 2019 to 2023 to pay a group called Californians for Justice. News outlet The Free Press reported the money was used for equity and diversity leadership training for students and teachers. The group's website says it advocated for implementing restorative justice practices in the district's 84 schools. The group gave a one-time stipend of $1,400 to 78 students who participated in the group's programs and gave out over $20,000 to 13 parents who participated in the program from 2019 to 2024. The group's website states its leadership development programs operate with a focus on low-income youth, youth of color, LGBT youth, foster youth, and immigrant youth. Up ahead. How will the Department of Defense allocate resources in the future? We hear testimony about the budget for 2025 and the future year's defense program. That and more when we return with NTD News. I was born into the wrong body. Mom. I was astounded by what they were teaching. Child Protective Services did show up at my house. Parents are fearful of losing custody of their children because they say the wrong thing. Risks? No, no risks. Uh, we got everything covered in short notice corners. They don't want anyone to know the truth. I can't stay quiet about this anymore. It's destroyed my health. We're pushed into silence. that truly matters for each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. Shen Hyun, coming to Lincoln Center, April 3rd through the 14th. Buy tickets now at ShenYun.com.
My dad's name was David. He always talked about getting life insurance, and now it's too late. No one was expecting my husband, Dave, to suffer from a heart attack. We didn't have life insurance. We thought we had more time. Don't be Dave, and don't wait until it's too late to get the life insurance coverage you need. And if you don't have enough insurance to cover funeral costs, credit card debt, and other expenses, your family is going to get stuck with the bill. Call now to get affordable life insurance. Just call. 800-494-1562. If you're over 50, you can't be turned down for this insurance, regardless of your health. Plus, there's no medical exam, no health questions. Your rate will never go up. Your coverage will never go down. And rates start as low as $5 a week. Remember, don't be Dave. Call now. Call now. 800-494-1562. I'm Arian Pastar in South America, Brazil, and we are NTD News. What's the future of the defense budget? The United States Senate Committee on Armed Services is discussing that. Defense authorities are set to testify on the budget request for fiscal year 2025 and the future year's defense program. Let's take a look. Uh provide security assistance to Ukraine, uh, but also our, our uh, um, partners uh, in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, specifically Taiwan. And, and so there, is, there, is provision, there are provisions in, there, in this supplemental request uh, to, uh, to continue to help Taiwan um, attain the capabilities to be able to, uh, to defend itself. And, and so I think it's for all for that reason, it's really important to make sure that we continue to put, press forward and, and get the supplemental across the goal line. So. Uh, military representatives from the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command met with PRC military representatives for the Mar Military Maritime Consultative Agreement Working Group in Honolulu, Hawaii, on April 3rd and 4th. This was the first meeting of its kind since the virtual working group meetings in 2021. What is the goal of the Military Maritime Consultative Agreement and what progress is being made with the PRC to prevent miscalculations and possible escalation within the Indo-PACOM? I think you've heard me say a number of times, uh, Senator, that it's really important when in this competitive relationship, and it is a relationship based upon competition, uh, that, that we, have, uh, we have guardrails and that we can uh, prevent uh, uh, incidents from spiraling out of control and, uh, and causing a, 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 a conflict at, at any one point in time. So that, that dialogue between military professionals, I think, is really important. We've seen very aggressive behavior in the, in the, uh, in the region on, uh, by the PRC. Uh, and we continue to raise these issues to the PRC. This forum allows uh, military professionals to meet uh, and, uh, and really talk in detail about those issues and talk about things that, uh, that we can put into place to prevent uh, accidents from happening. Thank you. Secretary Austin, over the last two NDAA cycles, I've created the Cyber Service Academy Scholarship Program to provide students with a free education in exchange for post-graduation service in DOD and the intelligence community. As you look at the department's cyber and digital needs, how does this scholarship help DOD meet its mission? Well, I, I, it's going to help uh, in a significant way. I mean, this is uh, um, working with some 420 uh, institutions, uh, providing 100 scholarships uh, uh, this year alone, and, and I, that increases the pool of, uh, of uh, qualified uh, youngsters that, uh, that can come on board and, uh, and be uh, and, and contribute to our efforts in the, in the cyber domain. So. You may not have this data, but do you know whether uh, we are on target to fill the 1,000 slots that are provided for this program this year? This year was the first year students could apply, and I think the application period concluded in March. Uh, do you have any uh, information about whether we are on target? I, I don't have that specific information, but I will get it for you right away. Thank you. And do you have any information about how many additional schools have applied to be part of the program? Uh, I, I don't have that either. But again, 
the number that we have, uh, 420, is, is really impressive, and I, it will continue to grow. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the military services have started to look at privatizing barracks in order to address barracks that are outdated and in need of repair. Given the problems that the military privatize, privatized housing initiative has encountered, how will the department ensure that those problems are not recreated in the barracks? Well, we, we number one, have to invest in uh, making sure that we create uh, uh, the right kind of uh, unaccompanied housing for our, our troops. And then number two, we, got to, we have to make sure that we invest in uh, the resources required to supervise the maintenance of, uh, of these facilities. And, and we're doing both of those. Uh, in this budget, we're asking you for $1.1 billion for unaccompanied housing, uh, $2, point, uh, $2 billion for uh, family housing, and then $171 million uh, for uh, housing oversight. Uh, so I, I think, I think, you know, there's we, we have to. There's a lot of work that we need to do going forward, and and I think uh, we're investing in the right things, and we'll we'll continue to keep uh, keep an, uh, maintain an emphasis on this. So. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Senator Jill Brown, Senator Cotton, please. Secretary Austin, thank you for acknowledging in response to Senator Wicker that uh, Hamas committed war crimes on October 7th and has been committing them every day since by using human shields. Um, I want to address what the protesters raised earlier. Uh, is Israel committing genocide in Gaza? Uh, Senator Cotton, I, we don't have any evidence of genocide uh, being uh, created. Uh, so that's a, uh, that's a no. Israel's not committing genocide in Gaza. We don't have evidence of that, to Thank my you. knowledge. Yeah. Better than Director Burns and Director Haynes did last, year, last month at the Intelligence Committee when they dodged that question. Um, you stand accused by those protesters of greenlighting genocide. Would you like to respond to that accusation? Uh, what I would say, uh, Senator Cotton, from the very beginning is that we uh, committed to help uh, assist uh, in, uh, Israel in defending its, uh, uh, its territory and its people by providing security assistance. And I would remind everybody that, you know, what happened on uh, October 7th was absolutely horrible. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Numbers of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Israeli citizens uh, um, killed, uh, and then um, a couple of hundred uh, Israeli citizens uh, taken hostage. American and citizens as well. American citizens right. as well. So, so you deny the accusation that you green, greenlit genocide? I, I absolutely deny. Okay. For the record, I don't think Israel is committing genocide. I don't believe you greenlit genocide either. Um, uh, you talked a lot with Senator Reid about Israel's responsibility to provide aid in Gaza. Why does Israel have a responsibility to provide aid to Gaza? Israel was the victim of an unprovoked, vicious attack on October 7th. Why should they provide aid to, their, to the aggressor nation? Or aggressor, uh, Gaza's not a nation, to the aggressors on October 7th. We didn't provide aid to Germany and Japan during World War II. Uh, what we, we did provide aid to uh, and assistance to many of the countries that we've operated in recently. As but not we, in World War II. If you had been in George Marshall's or Dwight Eisenhower's position in World War II, would you have wanted to provide aid to Germany? I, I, I really do believe, Senator, that if they want to create a, a lasting uh, effect in, in terms of uh, stability, then I think that uh, something needs to be done to account or to, uh, to help uh, the, the Palestinian people. I get, and, I, I get that, but they're in the middle of the war. Like, we, we believe that, too, after World War II. That's why we had the Marshall Plan. That's why we rebuilt Japan. But that was after the war was won, not in the middle of it. And in it, the meantime, like, if it's, it's not Israel's responsibility to provide aid. It's certainly not our responsibility, but we're spending ta our tax dollars to build this giant pier to send aid into Gaza. Who's going to accept that aid? Who's going to be at the end of the pier on the shore taking aid from American forces? It, that's, that's still uh, being worked out, but there, there will be... Uh... Uh, NGOs that, uh, that, that will help to distribute that but aid. Not, uh, that Hamas is in charge of Gaza. When aid goes to Gaza, Hamas doesn't divert it or commandeer it or steal it. It accepts it. And anybody operating in Gaza is under the thumb of Hamas. I, I just think it's very ill-considered, and I don't think it's going to end very well. Let me move on to Ukraine. Um, the Biden administration has discouraged Ukraine from launching refinery strikes against Russia. Why... Is the Biden administration discouraging Ukraine from 
undertaking some of the most effective tax, attacks on Russia's war making capabilities? Certainly, th those, those attacks could have uh, uh, a knock on effect uh, for in terms of the, the global energy uh, uh, situation. And, and, but quite frankly, I think Ukraine uh, is better served in, in going after uh, uh, tactical and, and, uh, and operational targets that, uh, that can directly influence uh, the current fight. So. so it sounds to me like the Biden administration doesn't want gas prices to go up in an election year based on all the other actions they've taken to drive up gas prices further. But anyway, I want to turn uh, to one final point about the recruiting crisis our services face. The Army is the most acute. It's challenging all services, though. I've spoken to uh, numerous recruiters, frontline recruiters, heads of recruiting battalions. Two of the most common things I hear is genesis and a lack of medical providers to process new recruits. Um, do you have a memo on your desk from the services to place a pause on genesis? Uh, no, uh, not. Have you received that? Because my sources tell me you've received a request from the services to pause genesis. Up next, Ukraine races to fix its power plants amid increased Russian attacks. We have the footage. In Russia, meanwhile, floods continue to threaten thousands of people, and the situation might get worse. We bring you the latest update when we return here on NTD News Today. The tempting online world is encroaching on our campus. Is unplugging cables and confiscating phones the solution to protect our children? No, we just need a clean multimedia platform. Join Ganjing Campus to leverage premium channel features, professional development courses, and kindness event toolkits tailored for teachers. Build a truly positive and interactive classroom community. Foster a pure and delightful learning environment for children. First time I came in here was Monday, and today is Thursday. I've had two surgeries and am doing fantastic. I'm still in shock that I can walk. That's all within four days. In fourth grade, I was diagnosed with scoliosis. I had 70 and 60 degree curvatures. Went to Shriners Hospital in LA. It's been fused ever since. I noticed a lot of pain going down my left buttock into my thighs and into my calf. I could be standing there and my legs would just go out. I went through pain management for two and a half years and the pain management specialist told me there was nothing more he could do for me. We actually did our own research and next thing I know, Dr. Benati called and he told me immediately over the phone what my issue was without even seeing me. I was in a twilight stage during surgery and you can actually say, where are you feeling that pain? And it immediately stops. Hold the leg up there. No pain here. No pain here. No pain on the butt. No. All of a sudden, they're all, do you want to get up and walk? Well, I couldn't walk before, and I got up, and I just started crying because I had no pain, and I had all my weight on my left leg and on my right leg, and I walked a straight line with no assistance, no falling, no grabbing onto the walls, nothing. I held my own weight, and that's the first time in months that I was able to walk by myself. Benati succeeds where others fail. For more stories like these and the rest of our program, check out American Medicine Today, featuring cutting-edge medical and science innovators and a medical professional's insight on political and social issues plaguing our nation and healthcare. American Medicine Today, Saturday 6 and Sundays at 9 on NTD Television and other streaming platforms. My mother was always very familiar with her neighborhood, but one day she stopped at the stop sign for much longer than usual and uh, she didn't know whether she should go forward or, or turn, and she wasn't even really sure where she was at. It was very unsettling for her. I felt so much better after my son told me, Mom, I don't want you to worry or be afraid. I'll be there for you, and we'll figure it out. I'm Iris Tao at the White House, and we are NTD.
Welcome back. As you just heard earlier, the United States Senate Committee on Armed Services is hearing about the military defense budget today. Authorities from the Secretary of Defense and Joint Chiefs of Staff are set to testify on the budget request for fiscal year 2025 and the future year's defense program. Let's take a look. Environment, um, we're in the communities where um, we have our troops uh, stationed is, uh, is a department priority. Uh, and, you know, we made a promise to the citizens of Hawaii to uh, conduct uh, any and all necessary uh, environmental remediation around the Red Hill facility. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to live up to that promise. Uh, as you know, uh, as you just pointed out, uh, last month, uh, uh, JTF Red Hill completed its defueling. Uh, and so uh, uh, the work has transitioned to the Department of the Navy now uh, for uh, the Red Hill uh, closure uh, efforts. And, and, and we're going to stay focused on that. And, and, you know, I will continue to uh, make sure that I uh, get briefed on this routinely and make sure that we're doing the right things to, uh, to uh, meet our timelines, but most importantly, make sure that we uh, do the right things in terms of environmental restoration. Thank you for your uh, continuing commitment because uh, there will be uh, uh, long-term, I would say, requirements as to monitoring, et cetera. So that brings me to uh, another question that I have for you. I am concerned about the department's ability to hold senior officials accountable following major incidents such as the fuel leak at Red Hill and the fire on board the U.S. Bonhomme Richard. I am including a provision in this year's NDAA that would create a new investigation category to provide consistency when there is a catastrophic incident resulting in a significant loss of life or billions of dollars in taxpayer money to ensure those responsible are held accountable for their actions. Would you be amenable to changes in this area, especially for catastrophic incidents such as uh, the ones that I cited? So that really the, the uh, investigation and the responsibility issues are before the department as opposed to the services that are involved. Uh, thank you, Senator. I, I've seen your, your correspondence on, uh, on this issue, and, and I've, uh, I've asked my, uh, my people to take a, take a look at this, and, uh, and certainly we will do so. We'll analyze it and, and come back and, uh, and, and have a discussion with you on, 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 uh, on where we are. But I really appreciate your continued focus on this. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I've talked about how important infrastructure is to readiness and uh, uh, I note that um, uh, during the last year's posture hearing, you agreed that the military services need to invest in infrastructure to make sure our service members have the facilities they need to execute their mission. However, even in the indo pacom Priority Theater, there are billions in infrastructure projects in Hawaii alone and the rest of the region, either on a service or indo pacoms unfunded priority list. Secretary Austin, how does the department ensure that infrastructure maintenance and modernization needs are met if there are multiple critical projects in Hawaii and throughout the region that are not being funded in the president's budget? Well, there, we, we have, as you know, Senator, invested uh, a lot uh, into infrastructure um, in, in throughout the region. And uh, our the PDI, the, the uh, Admiral Aquilino's uh, request uh, for the Pacific uh, Deterrence Initiative this year is some $9.9 .9 billion, and it includes uh, infrastructure projects. And that's on top of the $20 billion that uh, we've requested over the last uh, couple of years in support of the PDI. So we, we, we continue to invest in this. And, and, uh, and again, um, in terms of specific projects, um, you know, the services will have to We'll have to continue to rank order uh, what uh, uh, what you know their priorities are based upon you know what their specific budget uh, what's available in their budget. But this is very important to us and uh, and something that uh, we'll continue to, to work on. Well, you testified today that tough choices need to be made and near-term readiness, which is also making sure that our infrastructure is maintained. I just want to note one more thing. 
I am concerned about the cost overruns for the critical dry dock three, which is the biggest infrastructure project within the DOD replacement at Joint Base Pearl Harbor, Hickam. And uh, despite the lessons learned from Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, the cost of Pearl Harbor's dry dock recently increased by over $800 million. No sooner did I go and, and uh, give, give a speech about how important this dry dock is that I'm I am confronted by this, what I consider to be a massive cost overrun. How can we, I mean, I just want to note that uh, I'd like to hear from you. Um, I'm out of time to, right now, but we need to be a lot more accurate in planning for infrastructure projects from the beginning to enable us to, to um, better estimate how much uh, these uh, these costs are going to be because <laughs> to go from one week to say that you know this is great where we learn lessons from Portsmouth and then two weeks later uh, it, it's uh, 800 million more so Secretary Austin I I really would like to be a, a, assured that that you we are going to keep track of what's going on with this dry dock uh, infrastructure project in Hawaii because I have a feeling that I may be confronted with even more. Uh, co costly increases. It is a statement that I'm making, and I expect to be um, apprised as we go forward. Uh, absolutely. And uh, you mentioned that this dry dock's important. It is absolutely important. Uh, yeah. One of the things that happened here was that, uh, you know, we didn't fully uh, appreciate uh, the impact of COVID uh, on, the, uh, on the supply chains and, and some other things. And so, uh, Th that those effects have lasted longer than, than we anticipated, and uh, that's part of what's going on here. So, thank you, uh, Senator. Thank you, Senator Hirono. Uh, Senator Brown, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Secretary Austin, Secretary McCord, General Brown. Thank you for your service to the nation at such a time in history. Close coordination between Congress and and the administration is critical to making sure that our troops are resourced and postured in a way that deters conflict and enables them to dominate our enemies if deterrence fails. Mr. Secretary, the, uh, the Secretary Austin, uh, the assessment of the DOD NTIA-led study on the electromagnetic spectrum, which was completed last fall, was that the adoption of dynamic spectrum sharing is the only way that the DOD can share the portions of the critical bands it uses to defend our country and our forces. Developing that capability is one of my highest priorities. I'm aware of coordination between this committee and the DOD CIO, which is centered around a demonstration project to investigate dynamic spectrum sharing being executed sometime at the end of 2025. I applaud the effort, but I am also... Norfolk Southern has reached a $600 million settlement that would resolve all class action lawsuits within 20 miles of its East Palestine, Ohio derailment. The settlement is intended to offset costs related to the February 2023 accident that set a plume of toxic smoke into the air and displaced many people. More than a million pounds of hazardous chemicals spilled into the soil, water and air. State and federal environmental officials say testing shows the town is now safe. But some people still complain of burning eyes, tingling lips, swollen lymph nodes, and heaviness in their chest. As part of the settlement, those who live within 10 miles of the derailment can receive additional compensation. Norfolk Southern has not admitted to any liability or wrongdoing. The settlement still needs to be approved by a court. And now shifting gears, we have some short headlines from Germany and other European countries. Ukraine has to import energy as Russia keeps attacking power plants. Kyiv says Russia used almost 400 missiles and attack drones in a single week in late March. This reportedly cut off electricity and heating and even running water to 2 million Ukrainians. Russia says the energy system is a legitimate military target. Moscow described its attacks as revenge strikes for Ukraine's attacks on border regions. Ukraine now depends on quick repairs, like the one we see here, where people in protective suits and hard hats worked at a site impacted by an airstrike. 
Germany's agriculture minister today said he welcomes an agreement on restrictions on Ukrainian food imports. Farmers across the continent have protested cheap imports from Ukraine, which they say undercut prices. The European Union dropped tariffs at the beginning of the war to support Ukraine's economy. EU lawmakers on Monday said they reached a deal on new curbs. This will still require approval from other EU members and the European Parliament. Flood sirens blared out in two Russian cities today, warning thousands more to evacuate immediately. This amid the worst flooding in at least 70 years. Parts of the Russian city of Orenburg may be flooded in the next 24 hours. That's as water levels in two major rivers are set to keep rising. Melting snow across the Ural Mountains in Siberia has swelled the rivers. Over 10,000 homes have been flooded so far, and thousands more are at risk. European countries today signed an agreement to protect underwater infrastructure in the North Sea. The six nations say the joint declaration would allow them to share information. Threats to undersea cables and pipelines have become a concern for European countries. In September 2022, explosions damaged the Nord Stream pipelines built to deliver gas from Russia to Germany. Today's agreement includes protecting infrastructure from possible Russian attacks. For round-the-clock original news coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Stay with us and we'll bring you more in the next two hours. There are real consequences to controlled media. And NTD's founders know them firsthand. Our freedom of thought is the price. This is the lesson that guides us in everything we do. So there's the tear gas there. We know the value of a free society. And we take seriously the responsibility to preserve it. We are NTD. How'd it happen? She showed up dead on arrival. This never gets easier. It does when you call Car Shield before your car breaks down. Look at these prices. The camshaft, transmission, engine. Don't people know? A plan through Car Shield could protect up to 5,000 parts and systems. You hate to see it. An out of warranty car is gonna break down eventually. Right, which is why they need a plan through Car Shield. Those expensive repair bills get paid and at the mechanic of their choice. They're notifying the family. Poor guy, he doesn't even know what's coming. Another victim of senselessly expensive repair bills. Can't save them all. But we can keep trying. Mm. Didn't have to end this way. If he'd have just called Car Shield before his car broke down. <sighs> exactly. Protect yourself from the unprecedented rise in costs for parts and repairs. Call now to save money with your price lock guarantee. Call 800-429-5128. Just young people, hungry, homeless, and vulnerable. Abused youth often feel safer on the street. Now, more than ever, that's the most dangerous place of all. Covenant House is helping young adults facing homelessness. We're providing safe shelter to thousands, but the need is overwhelming, and no young person is ever turned away. Please call or go online now with your gift of $19 a month to help a young person. 
you'll provide safe shelter, hot meals, and medical care. Your gift will show them they're loved. Homeless young people are afraid and alone with nowhere else to turn. You want to know that there's somewhere you can go that's safe. So the Covenant House did that for us. Please call now with your gift of $19 a month. We'll send you this blanket as a reminder of the comfort your gift provides a young person tonight. Please don't wait. Your gift is the lifeline a young person needs now. Call the number on your screen or go online to safeplacetosleep.org. Thank you for saving precious lives. Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are today's top stories. UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron travels to Mar-a-Lago in Florida for a meeting with former President Trump. What the pair discussed and more. East Palestine, Ohio residents are going to see some compensation for last year's train derailment. Norfolk Southern agrees to a $600 million settlement. Paying high school students nearly $1,500 apiece to become racial and social justice activists. More on a controversial California program. What's the U.S. doing to stop bad actors trying to evade sanctions and fund dra drug trafficking, terrorism, and other illicit activities? The Treasury weighs in at a hearing today. The House is proposing to renew a controversial spying power, but it seeks to reform how the power is carried out. Find out what privacy advocates think. Lawmakers say President Biden's visa policy has a loophole that could allow Chinese spies to invade U.S. islands. Find out how it's possible. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Hi, I'm David Lamb, sitting in for Chris Beers. To begin the show, UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron met with former President Trump at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida. The pair yesterday discussed Ukraine and Gaza and other issues. The meeting is believed to be Trump's first with a senior British minister since leaving office. Cameron heads to Washington today. He plans to meet Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other political leaders to discuss Ukraine aid. Cameron's office says he will urge the approval of an extra $60 billion in supp supplementary funding earmarked for Ukraine, currently under consideration in Congress. Trump has previously declared that he would end the Ukraine war within days of being back in the White House. The Biden administration is trying to erase more student loan debt. The White House says the new strategy would help more than 30 million borrowers. That's if implemented and combined with plans the administration has enacted already. 
The initiative targets federal borrowers who have unpaid interest beyond a certain threshold, 20 or more years of repayment, eligibility for loan pro programs in which they're not enrolled, education from a so-called low financial value program, and certain hardships like medical debt. The new plans aren't ready for signups yet. It could take months to finalize them. And they'll likely face legal challenges. Many Republicans are pushing back on the plan, saying taxpayers who didn't go to college shouldn't have to pay for others. And joining us now to discuss all of this is Nathaniel Cogley, Associate Professor of Political Science at Tarleton State University. Nathaniel, good to see you again. The Biden, Biden is, is trailing Trump in support from young voters in multiple polls. How much is that playing into this? And do you think this move will be effective at winning their support? Thanks for having me. This is most definitely uh, a campaign strategy because the first time he tried drastic relief, he was struck by the court, struck down by the Supreme Court by exceeding his authority. This plan intentionally won't actually be released for several months, so it won't even be able to be challenged until after the election. But it's going to give him a nice talking point here going into the election to claim that he's uh, going to relieve all this debt. It's actually not going to be beneficial because, as you highlighted, not only taxpayers, but anyone who has to buy groceries at the store will pay for this through inflation. So it's going to target a benefit on a, key, on a small subset of Americans, but everyone else will be paying for it. Yes, it does strike me that this could potentially work in the opposite direction as well. Of course, some people will approve, and then there's a segment of people who will be quite um, ticked off by it, I suppose. Um, so Biden's plan, as we just heard earlier, um, is more targeted than his last one. In part, it offers relief for those who got degrees which have low financial returns. Could that potentially perpetuate the problem that it says it's trying to solve? You know. In, and also, it seems like it's not incentivizing universities to make their degrees more fiscally viable. Well, that's a very good point. So this has unintended consequences. By uh, the government bailing out these loans to unprofitable degree programs, it actually encourages it in the future. Another um, key point here is that they're, they're promising to forgive interest on people who haven't paid back these loans after 20 or 25 years, which also discourages people from paying off their loans in a timely manner. So yeah, unintended consequences are one of the, the main features of this bill and why it's probably not a bad idea. Why well, it probably is a bad idea, excuse me. And of course, the Supreme Court struck down Biden's last attempt at student loan forgiveness. Um, they, the Biden administration says they think that this one doesn't defy that ruling, but it does make you wonder where all of this could end up. Well, it'll be challenged in the court. Uh, last time, the Supreme Court ruled that Missouri did have standing to sue and that the drastic program went beyond the Secretary of Education's ability to modify and waiver the, the existing program actually passed by Congress. The fact that the details won't be released until after the election just del delays that legal challenge until after the election. But very very much so, some states might be able to sue and have this one struck down as well. It's just they won't do it till after the election. And coverage in the media seems to be uh, quite starkly contrasted on this topic, um, as on so many topics. But is there anything on this latest development that you think is missing from the public debate? Well, if you didn't get an unprofitable degree out of a university, or if you chose not to go to the university, you're going to pay for the, the, the people who did take these loans out for unprofitable degrees and for the universities that are perpetuating these unprofitable degrees on students. You're going to pay for this either through taxation or at the grocery store if this goes through. All right. Thank you so much, Nathaniel Cogley, Associate Professor of Political Science at, Science, Science at Tarleton State University. Thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up, it's been two weeks since the Baltimore Bridge collapse. A vigil is held for the victims, and Maryland's governor plans to meet with members of Congress. The Treasury warns about cryptocurrencies. Malign actors such as Hamas and North Korea allegedly use them for illegal transactions. More in just a moment, here on NTD News Today. Are today's mainstream martial arts not traditional martial arts? 
。现在有些人他学说传统武术，他尤其是西方人，他不懂。为什么要我们要举行大赛呢？因为新唐人他就是要提倡传统武术，复兴中华五千年的传统文化。传统武术，真正的传统武术是讲武德的。我相信有一点，就是守住武德就有人教。This is it. The culmination of everything our young athlete has worked for these past months is filled with determination. You can see it in his face. Is today the day he overcomes? And here we go. There is no defense in the world that will keep him at bay. He's on fire. Nothing can stop him. Watch him as he heads towards the goal. Oh, he's blocked hard, but that doesn't stop him. He's a warrior. He's back up. His eyes are on the goal. He's set up for the shot. He shoots. Goal! Achieving goals like this is only possible with the monthly support of people just like you. Please call the number on your screen right now and give your monthly support to Shriners Hospitals for Children so other children can reach their goals too. If you give just $19 a month, only 63 cents a day, we will send you your very own Love to the Rescue Blanket as a reminder of the love you're giving us. Because of monthly support of people like you, nothing is stopping me from achieving my goals. And here we go. There is no defense in the world that will keep him at bay. He's going left. Oh, he fakes right and continues. Look at those moves. He takes the shot. Goal! Good shot. <laughs> Please call or go online now. If operators are busy, Call again or go to loveshriners.org to give right away. Your monthly gift helps kids achieve their goals. Goal! Welcome back. Norfolk Southern is paying $600 million to settle lawsuits related to the February 2023 train derailment in Eastern Ohio. The agreement doesn't admit any liability or wrongdoing. The settlement would resolve all class action claims within a 20-mile radius of the catastrophe in East Palestine, Ohio. The deal would also settle personal injury claims within a 10-mile radius from the derailment. About 50 cars of the freight train derailed near the Pennsylvania state line, some transporting hazardous materials. Around 2,000 of the town's approximately 4,800 residents were evacuated. Payments could begin by the end of the year, provided that the court for the Northern District of Ohio approves. An update in the Hunter Biden tax evasion case. The judge has ruled there were problems in Biden's request to submit more material to support his arguments to dismiss the case. The judge says the first son's approach had multiple shortcomings in addition to submitting the filing late. Those include failing to schedule a hearing for the motion, not outlining the legal standard, and failing to justify the need for supplemental material. The judge also says Hunter Biden had the chance to present arguments during a three-hour hearing, but failed to do so adequately. Ultimately, the judge stated that submitting further materials would not change the decision to deny the motions. Hunter Biden's legal team had previously submitted eight motions to dismiss, arguing political pressure and immunity from a previous plea deal. They were all rejected. Family and friends of the victims of the Baltimore Bridge collapse held a prayer service and a candlelight procession yesterday. The six victims of the bridge collapse were all immigrants from Mexico and Central America. They were repairing potholes on the road surface of the bridge when it collapsed. During the procession, people carried six crucifixes bearing the names of the victims and the flags of the countries they came from. The container ship Dolly 
struck a pylon of the bridge after a power failure, causing the entire structure to crumble into the water within seconds. Maryland Governor Wes Moore said yesterday he plans to address Congress on support for rebuilding the Francis Scott Key Bridge. He plans to emphasize the economic impact of the port. The governor called it an opportunity to support a port that's directly responsible for the hiring of tens of thousands of people. Emergency legislation to aid port employees was recently approved. It's awaiting Moore's signature. Moore underscored the ongoing efforts to support effective families and recover the remaining victims. And lawmakers will move forward today with a proposal to reauthorize a controversial spying power that has ignited sharp disputes about government overreach and privacy protections. Let's watch that. The authority in question is Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It's one of several post-9-11 surveillance authorities that have come under scrutiny. It allows intelligence officials to gather information on foreign actors working outside of the United States. A House bill aims to reauthorize the power, but reform the controversial part. A series of abuses have come to light that have thrown the future of the entire process into question. In 2021, it was discovered that 3.3 million queries on Americans were made under Section 702. The next year, there were fewer queries, but they still reached nearly 300,000. The same mechanism was used to spy on President Donald Trump's 2016 campaign during the ill-fated Crossfire Hurricane investigation. The investigation was predicated on the idea that President Trump's campaign was working with Russia. The basis of the investigation was later proved false and improper. It's also been improperly used on political campaign donors, January 6 protesters, and Black Lives Matter protesters. In response to these and many other reported abuses, the reauthorization bill would make some changes to how information is collected and implement safeguards. But privacy advocates still feel the new bill lacks all the necessary protections. When President Biden was still a senator, he opposed the creation of Section 702 and called it unconstitutional. But since taking office, he's been a staunch supporter of Section 702, and his administration has urged Congress to reauthorize it. Republican lawmakers in New York State are now going against so-called squatters. They've introduced a bill that would make it easier for landlords to remove people occupying their property without permission. The New York bill is similar to a law passed recently in Florida. It would shift the burden of proof from the owner to the person occupying the residence. The squatter would have to prove that they have the right to be on the property. Right now, any person who's occupying a New York property for more than 30 days is considered a tenant, even if they never signed a lease or paid rent. The bill would change that to 45 days. And a California activist group is paying high school students $1,400 each to become racial and social justice activists. That's according to contracts between the group and the Long Beach Unified School District. The school district used nearly $2 million in taxpayer funds from 2019 to 2023 to pay a group called Californians for Justice. News outlet The Free Press reported the money was used for equity and diversity leadership training for students and teachers. The group's website says it advocated for implementing restorative justice practices in the district's 84 schools. The group gave a one-time stipend of $1,400 to 78 students who participated in the group's programs and gave out over $20,000 to 13 parents who participated in the program from 2019 to 2024. The website also states its leadership development programs operate with a focus on low-income youth, youth of color, LGBT youth, foster youth, and immigrant youth. The Treasury Department is calling for more regulation over cryptocurrency. The department warned yesterday that terrorists use cryptocurrencies to hide their identities and move assets, and state actors like Russia use virtual currency to finance the war in Ukraine. Deputy Secretary Wally Adeyemo wants to Congress to approve new regulatory tools for digital assets. He says terror groups like Al-Qaeda and Hamas use them for their own benefit, and state actors like Russia and North Korea use them to circumvent sanctions. Adeyemo says the Treasury needs stronger tools to go after such actors. 
He mentioned sec secondary sanctions targeting foreign cryptocurrencies that enable illicit finance. And as tensions rise in the Middle East and the biggest state sponsor of terrorism issues warnings to the U.S. and its ally Israel, the Treasury Department at home is examining actions to counteract illicit finance, terrorism, and sanctions evasion. Let's tune in groups to make sure that they had the ability to continue to provide legitimate aid and financial assistance in uh, Gaza. One of the things that we learned at that point was the challenge wasn't U.S. sanctions given our humanitarian carve-out, but were the sanctions put in place by some of our allies. Soon after, I traveled to Europe and with our European allies, work with them to put in place a similar humanitarian carve-out in their program in order to put us all in the same position where we could both target actions to go after Hamas, but to ensure that legitimate humanitarian assistance can flow through. Um, my goal and my team's goal is to continue to meet with financial institutions, but also with aid groups to ensure that our sanctions are in no way prohibiting the legitimate flow of financial resources and other resources into Gaza. Because to your point, I agree that not enough is being done, not enough is getting through, and we have to do everything in our power to make sure that we change that dynamic. So, so what, what needs to happen for the delivery of aid to be more effective? So, Senator, this is not primarily in my um, domain. The issues that are in my domain, though, are making sure that financial resources are able to flow. And the goal there has to be the continued engagement, not only of the United States government, but of the UK government and the EU government, the countries that are primarily putting sanctions in place with our financial institutions and with our humanitarian groups to ensure that they are not in any way being blocked in the delivery of legitimate humanitarian assistance. What I've heard from those groups to date is that the challenge they face is a fiscal one in terms of being able to get aid in, not a financial one. And But what I've also told them is the moment they feel as if in some way they have a financial block, I want them to call me immediately because our goal is to make sure that our sanctions are targeted towards Hamas, not towards um, impacting the innocent Palestinian people. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so very much. We have to work to ensure that there's rigorous oversight of aid to Palestinians, working also with our uh, European and other allies to both ensure that it actually provides assistance to those in need. Uh, and we want to certainly make uh, sure that uh, Hamas does not divert any sort of aid for its own purposes. Thank you so very much, Mr. Thank Secretary. You. Thanks, Senator Warnock. Uh, Senator Britt of Alabama is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will get right to it. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate the opportunity to have the conversation. Is there any doubt in your mind that the Iranian regime is the largest state sponsor of terrorism um, against the United States and our allies across the globe? None, Senator. None. So when we look at this, you know, I take a step back and kind of it is it's frustrating for me because I see um, this administration take a posture of, of appeasement. When I'm looking at it, you look from the decline of the strategy of maximum pressure under the previous administration to kind of where we are now. And I'm thinking if we all agree that that, that Iran is the largest state sponsor of terrorism, why wouldn't we be using you know, every tool in our toolbox to make sure that we prevent them um, from benefiting financially? And so we've seen Iran's oil profits soar um, since January 2021, reaching over $80 billion and counting, and its steel exports have actually increased twofold. So I guess my question is, has the Biden administration's enforcement authorities, have, have your sanctions enforcement authorities been limited at all since you've gotten into Treasury? No, Senator. We've put in place 571 sanctions against the Iranian regime. And I know that we've spoken personally about what's happening with steel, where we've, we've sanctioned the top steel producers in Iran. And the steel they're selling today is illicit and illegal. We have to do more and must do more okay. to cut off that illicit um, transaction. But those companies have been sanctioned by us. So let's talk about the steel specifically. What more do you think we could be doing? What tools do you need or um, could could we use at a, at a greater level in order to crack down on that? So, Senator, one of the things we have to do and that we are doing is working closely with the intelligence um, community to find out how they're illicitly selling uh, what is illegal steel at this point mm -hmm. to go after those nodes that are helping them to do that. So 
Um, what you should expect is we're going to continue to take actions there. One of the reasons I'm here, though, is that um, you mentioned oil. And while Iran is selling oil, one of the challenges they're having is getting the money back to Iran, given mm -hmm. what we're doing in the financial sector. The thing that I am worried about is that Iran will increasingly turn from using the formal financial sector to move their assets and increasingly use cryptocurrency because we don't have well, tools. If there. you just look at where you are right here on, so if you look at, you know, we hit Iran's oil, you mentioned the oil exports receipt, they reached a, a five year high last year of 42 billion compared to, if you look at the 2020 numbers, 7.9 billion. What do you attribute to that, to that difference? One of the things that the Iranians are increasingly doing is they're consistently looking for ways to do everything from ship to ship transfers, using the gray fleet, using intermediaries to try and sell their oil. While we've put in place more than 500 sanctions against Iran, what we're finding is that the Iranian regime, given their desperate need for cash, is doing things to try and get around our sanctions. So we're going to continue to use our sanctions authorities, but ultimately um, that is going to continue to make it more costly for Iran to try and get around them, but they're going to continue to try. Are there any kind of, given the data points of this past year and it being a high versus where we were in 2020, are there any tools in your toolbox that you're not using to the fullest extent possible? So, Senator, I think the thing that I've asked my team to do is to come back to me and talk about what else we can do. And I think the key for us is not only what the United States can do, but how do we build an international coalition, frankly, because one of the things that we benefited from in the past was that it wasn't just the United States acting, but we were acting alongside our allies and partners. And while today we've been able to get uh, in other countries to come alongside actions we've taken against UAVs when it comes to Iran and mm -hmm. some of their military components, we've been less successful in terms of going after their petrochemical industry. So I think part of this is a diplomatic effort to get other countries to join us in taking those actions because what Iran is doing is that they're moving their petrochemical industry into the shadows and they have and they're doing things that have fewer touch points with the US dollar which is the thing that I can use so we need to get other Are there loopholes specifically that they're that they're using with regards to Russia and China that um, that where we where we need to close those so in terms of the petrochemical industry, they're actually a competitor to Russia because fundamentally they're selling the same thing on the market. So I think they are not working together in this space. I think from my standpoint. Coming up, Tesla settles a lawsuit over a crash that killed an Apple engineer when the car's autopilot swerved off of a highway near San Francisco. Don Ma has the details when we return with NTD News. You know, these kids grow so fast. Cherish every little moment you get with them. Tyler, he's a uh, 10, and uh, little Daryl, he's uh, 12. Being a single dad, it is hard, really hard. I've been there since day one. I know how it is, you know, not to have nothing. I don't really uh, get paid much. <laughs> There's been times I've been hungry. Make sure they eat. There ain't a thing I wouldn't do for them. Millions of our neighbors are facing hunger. Rising food prices are making it tougher to put food on the table. Call or go online right now to join Feeding America with your gift of just $19 a month, only 63 cents a day. Together, thanks to a nationwide network of food banks, dedicated volunteers, and the monthly support of people like you, we can fill plates with nutritious food for families across America. At least now I know I gotta you know, help if I need it. One in five children face hunger in America, and food costs are rising. We are getting closer to the day when no one in America faces hunger, but we can't do it without you. Call or go online now. Visit helpfeedingamerica.org and give $19 a month, just 63 cents a day. 98% of donations go directly to help millions of people facing hunger, from coast to coast and in your own community. And when you use your credit card, You'll receive this exclusive Canvas grocery bag to show you're a part of a movement working together to ensure that everyone has the food and resources we all need to thrive. If you're hungry, you know, if they got it, they'll feed you. People just gotta realize, you know, places like this do exist that will help you. Please call now or make your monthly donation at helpfeedingamerica.org. Working together, we can end hunger in America.
I have never seen a production any better than this anywhere. Breathtaking. It is absolutely stunning. I feel better about the world. I feel uplifted. Invigorating. It was encouraging. Gave me hope. This has just been therapy for the soul. It's a must see. Must see. Make sure you see it. Make sure you see it. Coming to Lincoln Center, NJ Pack, State Theater, Purchase, and Stamford. Genuine.com. Life doesn't always give you time to change the outcome. Prediabetes does. One in three adults has prediabetes, but with early diagnosis, prediabetes can be reversed. And you can change the outcome. Take the one minute prediabetes risk test today. Go to doihaveprediabetes.org. We've been hearing from Wally Adeyemo, Deputy Secretary of the Department of the U.S. Treasury, speaking at a Senate Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs. It's investigating actions to counteract illicit finance, terrorism and sanctions evasion. Let's tune back in. Those actions in the traditional financial system will mean that more of these actors will likely turn to things like virtual currencies to try and escape us unless we update uh, and reform some of the rules that we have today for going after those actors. I'm interested also in learning about, and, and this is a new term um, because of crypto, but learning about uh, cryptocurrency mixers. Uh, and you talked a little bit about that, that help facilitate illicit financing. My understanding are that mixers are, are, are crypto platforms that enable users to exchange cryptocurrency anonymously by blending the cryptocurrencies of many users to obfuscate the origins and owners of the funds. And in 2022, almost 10% of all crypto addresses tied to illicit activity were laundered through mixers. So Deputy Secretary, can you explain a little bit about these mixers and the acute risk of bad actor, act, actors using them to engage in illicit finance? Senator, you, I think you um, made it very clear what they are. There are ways for people and for entities to hide their identity and to move money illicitly through the crypto ecosystem with the hope that they can turn that into hard currency at some other point and be able to get access to their ill-gotten gains. Uh, we've taken some actions against mixers, including using a 311 action to go after them. But my concern is that without the tools that we've requested from the Senate, we don't have the ability to go after these parts of the virtual currency ecosystem that, uh, that are being used by threat actors but may not be based or have U.S. jurisdiction. That's why we think it's essential that we get these tools because as we take steps to go after the traditional financial system where we have a great deal of visibility where these threat actors exist, they're naturally going to turn to new tools like mixers to hide their identity. Absolutely. And that's why I appreciate uh, the need for the expanded tools of enforcement for areas like this and support it. Thank you. I do think it is so important we address um, the use of cryptocurrency uh, for money laundering and to engage in illicit activities for so many reasons. So thank you for being here again. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Cortez. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for joining us, uh, for being here and providing testimony. Senators who wish to submit questions for the record, those questions are due one week from today, Tuesday, April 16th. The witness will have 45 days to respond to those. Thank you again. Uh, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you, Senator. When we look here at home, there's not a single neighborhood, whether that's Charleston, South Carolina, or Cleveland, Ohio, that has escaped the death grip of fentanyl. I'm very proud of this committee's work to address this crisis and for the support of all the members of this committee working together to stop this deadly drug. Because what fentanyl produced and trafficked by Mexican cartels and supported through Chinese precursors has done to our communities is a national security crisis. 
I remain committed to seeing this legislation passed into law and to stop the flow of illicit money and drugs across our border. Every family in America deserves to be free from the scourge of this deadly drug. I started with these two issues because I believe they should be top of mind for this administration and for this committee. And yet, just last week, Secretary Yellen was in China to discuss how cheap Chinese exports of green energy technology are harming electric vehicles and solar energy here in the United States. This is a clear climate goal of the, this administration, but far from the top goal we should be pushing back China on. A perspective that's frankly hard to stomach when Hamas is enabled by support from Iran to carry out horrific attacks against our ally, Israel. All while China continues to be the top purchaser of Iranian oil and top financier to international web of illicit financing used by the Mexican cartels to kill people using fentanyl. This needs to stop. Saving lives cannot play second fiddle to progressive climate goals. We need to see real efforts by China to stop these activities that undermine U.S. national security interests. America must be a strong leader. Fentanyl and terrorism are leading threats and should be treated as such. American families deserve to know that their government is protecting them from these threats and punishing those who trouble us. Thank you. Thank you for holding this hearing. I look forward to the opportunity to question. Uh, thanks, Senator Scott. I'll introduce today's witness. The Honorable Wale Adeyemo as Deputy Secretary of Treasury, held a range of senior economic and national security positions. He briefed this committee in the immediate aftermath of the tragedy of the October 7th attacks. Welcome back. Please proceed. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today. I want to thank you and the members of the committee for your willingness to work with us to address the threats to our national security. I'm here today because we need additional tools to protect the American people. And I appreciate the fact that this committee has not shied away from providing us with tools in the past, and I look forward to working with you to make sure that we have the tools that are necessary going forward. As we take steps to cut terrorist groups and other malign actors off from the traditional financial system, we are increasingly concerned about the ways these actors are using cryptocurrencies to circumvent our sanctions. For example, years ago, Al-Qaeda and affiliated terrorist groups largely based out of Syria operated a Bitcoin money laundering network using social media platforms to solicit cryptocurrency donations. After receiving virtual currency, they laundered the proceeds through various online gift card exchanges to be able to purchase what they needed to advance their violent agenda. Most recently, over the past year, we have seen the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Quds Force transfer cryptocurrency to Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza. In addition, we have seen Hamas use virtual currencies to solicit small dollar donations, and we've been able to take actions against these networks. All right, joining us now is NTD's Business Matters host, Don Ma, to give us the latest updates from the tech and business world. Don, good to see you, and thanks for joining us. So what do you have for us today? Just one topic I want your, uh, to bring to your attention today, and it's about Tesla. Uh, not very good news, apparently, but here's what it is. Uh, Tesla has settled a high-profile case uh, that is going to set the picture uh, for uh, this case going forward, uh, which is that it's going to put the electric car company and its controversial automated driving system. Uh, it was going to go on trial yesterday, but because of the settlement, it won't. Uh, the terms of the settlement were not disclosed. Uh, jury selection was actually originally set to begin yesterday uh, in a wrongful death suit filed by the family of a former Apple engineer, uh, which he died, by the way, after his Tesla Model X crashed while the autopilot feature was engaged. So the child trial could have actually lasted several weeks, but parties settled. Now, Walter Huang was killed when his Tesla struck a concrete highway median in Silicon Valley in 2018. And the National Transportation Safety Board's investigation found that the autopilot uh, feature was engaged for nearly 19 minutes before the fatal crash. 
uh, when the car, which by the way, was traveling at a very high speed of 71 miles per hour, uh, it veered off the highway. But there's also evidence indicating that Huang was playing a video game on his iPhone when the car crashed. Ah, oh, so tragic. Yeah. Uh, we do look forward to hearing more updates on that. This is a key issue that many people are wondering about the viability of this technology. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, our uh, condolences go out to the family. Yeah. Thank you so much, Don. Thank you, Don. And coming up, lawmakers say a Biden visa policy has a loophole that could be exploited by spies. It allows Chinese nationals to gain access to U.S. territory without a visa. President Biden is hosting the leaders of Japan and the Philippines this week. What's on the table at the meeting between Washington and its Asian allies? More shortly here on NTD News Today. How'd it happen? She showed up dead on arrival. This never gets easier. It does when you call Car Shield before your car breaks down. Look at these prices. The camshaft, transmission, engine. Don't people know? A plan through Car Shield could protect up to 5,000 parts and systems. You hate to see it. An out of warranty car is going to break down eventually. Right, which is why they need a plan through Car Shield. Those expensive repair bills get paid and at the mechanic of their choice. They're notifying the family. Poor guy. He doesn't even know what's coming. Another victim of senselessly expensive repair bills. Can't save them all. But we can keep trying. Mm. Didn't have to end this way. If he'd have just called Car Shield before his car broke down. <sighs> exactly. Protect yourself from the unprecedented rise in costs for parts and repairs. Call now to save money with your price lock guarantee. Call 800-429-5128. When I started my pillow, it was just a problem solution one product company. Well, since then, with the help of my dedicated employees, we now have hundreds of products, some you might not even know about. To get the word out, we're having a $25 extravaganza. Two pack multi use My Pillows, $25. My Pillow Sandals, $25. And for the first time ever, our six pack towel sets. You guessed it, just $25. Our brand new four pack dish towels, $25. And I've never done this before. Premium My Pillows with all new Giza fabric, any size, any loft level, even king size for only $25. And there's so much more. So go to mypillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use your promo code for our $25 extravaganza. Order $75 and over, your entire order ships absolutely free. According to Marx, everything must be seen through the lens of oppressor and oppressed. Our property rights have continued to get weaker. The threat of these takings is no longer just for public use, but also for better use. This means that the government can force the exchange of property from one private citizen to another private citizen. This is nowhere near the Founding Fathers' intentions. We now have a record share of Americans that have never been married, I being one of them. In fact, the median age of a first marriage has never been higher. Now you may be thinking this is only affecting single adults. Well, not exactly. According to Pew Research, one in four parents living with their child are unmarried. And let's take a look at how many children are currently living with either one parent or no parent. Want to know what's really happening around the world? Join us for a deep dive discussion with our expert panel on International Reporters Roundtable. More bargain-based stores are set to close down. The California-based 99 cents only stores said Friday it will close all 371 of its outlets. This will end the chain's 42 years of selling an assortment of affordable items. For analysis, I spoke with Jeffrey Tucker, a senior economic columnist with the Epic Times. He's also founder and president of the Brownstone Institute. Jeffrey, great to see you again. 
Now, after being founded in 1982, the 99 cents only stores, they're going out of business. What do you make of the mass closure of cheap stores across the U.S.? There's a number of things that work here. One is the danger of naming your store after a price in highly inflationary times. That the the dollar stores around where I live are have all become dollar twenty five stores, and they're soon going to become dollar fifty stores, and eventually two dollar stores. So they still call themselves a dollar store, but it's going to be the two dollar store. So that's that's a, a danger in inflationary times. It's really sad. Ideally, you'd like to live in a world with sound money, where the prices wouldn't change, and in fact. Ideally, the money would grow even more valuable over time. That's what would happen if you had a good monetary system. But that's not the system we have right now. So we're living in times of tremendous depreciation of the currency. Uh, anywhere between 25% and 60% uh, just in the last four years. So it's, it's very sad. Uh, the, the additional problem in, on the West Coast is the increase in minimum wages, the, the wage floors, are making it very difficult for small and medium-sized businesses. So the regulatory environment is not, not good for enterprise right now. What does the closure um, signal about our economy going forward? Uh, well, it's very sad. The, the American standard of living is in a dramatic state of decline. And I don't care what the Wall Street Journal is telling you or the New York Times. I mean, this is, it's just not true. I read all these articles about how these are the best of times. The, the data is fake. The output data is fake. The inflation data is, is wrong. The jobs numbers are all ridiculous. Uh, none of it's true. And the average consumer's intuition is that we are losing our standard of living. And that intuition is correct regardless of what the official data say. And I, I can tell you everything that's wrong with all the official data, but, and only just point to the popular opinion polls. You ask people if they're better off now than they were five years ago, the answer is almost universally no. And people are scared, and they're right to be scared. Well, so if we're looking back a couple of years ago, there was the pandemic. So what are the lasting impacts from the COVID-19 lockdowns and how they're still affecting businesses today? Uh, during the lockdowns, there was a tremendous uh, a barrage of money printing and spending by by Congress, and that's showing itself now in the form of inflation. We don't know when that's going to come to an end. Uh, the other problem is that a lot of industries have not entirely uh, recovered. I mean, supply chains are broken. Also, people's habits changed. Movie theaters are suffering right now. They were down 19 percent from where they were uh, just a few years ago. Uh, many are just barely struggling to stay alive. Big business thrived during lockdowns, but millions of small businesses closed, and a lot of others are still trying to uh, uh, recover from that calamity. Uh, and here we are, uh, four years later, and and the the carnage is is still with us, and we're far from having recovered from that. All right, Jeffrey, thank you so much for your insight and for joining us. Okay, pleasure. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is backing efforts to force TikTok's divestment from its Chinese regime-linked parent company. The Republican leader says it's urgent that a bill is passed to take one of Beijing's favorite tools of espionage off the table. McConnell says TikTok is a national security threat with an algorithm that pours gasoline on alarming trends. He pledged his support for common-sense bipartisan steps. The House voted overwhelmingly last month to give TikTok's owner ByteDance about six months to divest its U.S. assets or face a ban in U.S. app stores. Other bills are being floated in the Senate that would address the Chinese-owned app, including one from Senator Josh Hawley for an outright ban. Hawley welcomed McConnell's support, but he said he thinks the chances are less than 50-50 that a strong bill would make it to a vote. Senator Hawley says Bill to ban the app sends a message to communist China that Congress cannot be bought. And a visa policy raising espionage concerns, two Republican lawmakers are urging the Biden administration to end what they call a visa loophole. It's a 2009 policy that allows Chinese nationals to enter the Northern Mariana Islands, a U.S. territory, without a visa for two weeks. The concern is from there, they may be able to enter Guam, home to two U.S. military bases. The two territories are a little over 120 miles apart. 
Senator Joni Ernst and Congressman Neil Dunn say this could allow Chinese spies to access U.S. military installations. Ernst told the New York Post that the U.S. must change this visa policy. This comes as a rising number of Chinese nationals are found near sensitive U.S. sites. An illegal Chinese immigrant was arrested this March for breaching a U.S. military base. Chinese nationals have also been caught scuba diving near U.S. rocket launch sites and snapping photos of White House communication gear and guard positions. The Department of Homeland Security has defended the visa policy, saying that no visitor can travel to other parts of the U.S. from the Northern Marianas, including Guam, without a visa. President Biden is hosting the leaders of Japan and the Philippines this week. The allies seek to boost economic and defense ties to offset China's growing power in the region. Biden's summit with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida on Wednesday will bring an upgrade in defense ties with Japan. Then on Thursday, Kishida will become the second Japanese leader to address a joint meeting of Congress. His predecessor gave a speech in 2015. Biden will also hold a meeting with Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos on Thursday. Last year, Marcos and Biden joined Kishida for a trilateral summit that focused on the South China Sea. Other issues on the agenda this year include managing risks from North Korea and the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. Germany's top corporate brass is joining Chancellor Olaf Scholz when he visits China later this month. Among the big names, the CEOs of Siemens, Mercedes-Benz and semiconductor chemicals maker Merck KGAA. Despite Germany pushing for a strategy to de-risk from China, the communist country remains its largest trading partner. Last year, German direct investment into China hit a record high, $12.9 billion, an over 4% increase from the previous year. Some of Germany's biggest firms, such as chemical giants BASF and automaker Volkswagen, still bank on China as a growth motor. Though, a number of smaller firms have started to change track, taking steps to legally separate their Chinese businesses. And before we head to break, if you have any feedback, please email us at news.ntd.com. That's news.today at ntd.com. But be, be sure to stay with us. We'll have more stories in just a moment. There are real consequences to controlled media. And NTD's founders know them firsthand. Our freedom of thought is the price. This is the lesson that guides us in everything we do. So there's the tear gas there. We know the value of a free society. And we take seriously the responsibility to preserve it. We are NTD. What's happened to this world we're living in? Why? For the four years he has been on this earth, he has known nothing but war. Wherever I go, the things I see, I just want to turn away. The dreams I have, the stories I could tell, will they still be possible? This year, more than ever, I need a brand new world. A clean world. Where I can improve myself and be inspired. My stage can be anywhere and everywhere but it begins here.
Tianjin World, a brighter way of life. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, ride your bike. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, smile big and bright. Thousands of kids just like me are happy every day. And it's all because of generous people like you who support Shriners Hospitals for Children every month. All you have to do is call the number on your screen or go online to loveshriners.org right now with your monthly gift. Because of people like you, Shriners Hospitals for Children is able to make an everyday miracle happen for kids like me. If you're happy and you know it, dance around. If you're happy and you know it, play a song. If you're happy and you know it, and Surely show it if you're happy and you know it. Take a shot. And when you call or go online right now to donate nineteen dollars a month or more, we'll send you this adorable love to the rescue blanket as a thank you and a reminder of all the smiles you're bringing to kids' faces every day. Will today be the day you send your love to the rescue? When you call the number on your screen right now and give as little as nineteen dollars a month, just sixty-three cents a day, you'll be making a life-changing difference for a child, just like Sarah. Your monthly gift today could change your life forever. Because of you, we are happy and we know it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please call or go online right now to give. If operators are busy. Please wait patiently, or go to loveshriners.org right away. Does shopping for bladder control products have you feeling like you need someone to be on the lookout for you? Now you have your privacy back. We're HDIS, and we home deliver bladder control products directly to you. We're always on the lookout for you. You get free shipping in plain, unmarked boxes. So your private matters stay private. We understand how you feel. For over 35 years, we've delivered bladder control products to millions of Americans, just like you. You don't have to worry about incontinence any longer. Call now for your free product sample pack and over $45 in money-saving coupons. At HDIS, we're always in stock. We carry all brands in hundreds of styles and sizes. You'll be sure to get what you need, guaranteed. For your free sample pack with your free catalog and $45 in money-saving coupons and free product samples, call 800-701-6159. That's 800-701-6159. Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are our top stories. A New York appeals court judge blocks former President Trump's attempt to delay his first criminal trial. Plus, more appeals in New York, D.C., and Georgia courts waiting to be heard. Our legal correspondent has the updates. An Idaho teenager is under arrest for planning a deadly attack at a church. Authorities say he was trying to support the terrorist group ISIS. More on the FBI's timely intervention. 
East Palestine, Ohio residents are going to see some compensation for last year's train derailment. Northbrook Southern agrees to a $600 million settlement. Michigan will be sentencing the parents of Oxford high school shooter Ethan Crumbly today. Find out more about this landmark case. The House is proposing to renew a controversial spying power, but it seeks to reform how the power is carried out. Find out what privacy advocates think. And in college basketball, UConn tops Purdue to win their second straight championship. Entity's Dave Martin joins us to discuss the game. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Hi, I'm David Lamb, sitting in for Chris Beers. And in Michigan, the parents of Oxford high school shooter Ethan Crumbly will be sentenced later today. Both were convicted of manslaughter. Jennifer and James Crumbly were tried separately earlier this year. They both face up to 15 years in prison in connection with the 2021 shooting. Prosecutors said the parents were criminally negligent for providing a gun to their child and for ignoring warning signs of his mental health issues. The parents' defense teams argued it was impossible for the parents to envision their son committing a shooting. In the landmark case, the Crumblies became the first parents to be charged with manslaughter for a child's school shooting. Norfolk Southern is paying $600 million to settle lawsuits related to the February 2023 train derailment in eastern Ohio. The agreement doesn't admit any liability or wrongdoing. The settlement would resolve all class action claims within a 20-mile radius of the catastrophe in East Palestine, Ohio. The deal would also settle personal injury claims within a 10-mile radius from the derailment. About 50 cars of the freight train derailed near the Pennsylvania state line, some transporting hazardous materials. Around 2,000 of the town's approximately 4,800 residents were evacuated. Payments could begin by the end of the year, provided that the court for the Northern District of Ohio approves. And the FBI arrested a man for allegedly making plans to attack churches in Idaho and pledging his allegiance to ISIS. The Justice Department says 18-year-old Alexander Mercurio planned to use knives, guns and fire to attack churches in Coeur d'Alene, Ohio, Idaho in, on Sunday. Investigators believe his alleged efforts intensified after ISIS took responsibility for last month's deadly attack on a Moscow concert venue. Mercurio was charged with attempting to provide material support or resources to a designated foreign terrorist organization. He faces a maximum penalty of 20 years in federal, federal prison if convicted. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel will eradicate Hamas's brigades including in the southern Gaza city of Rafah. That's despite pressure, including from the U.S., not to assault the city. We will complete the elimination of the Hamas battalions, including in Rafah. There is no force in the world that will stop us. There are many factors trying to do this, but it will not help because this enemy, after what he has done, will not do it again. The Israeli leader said yesterday that, that a date has been set for an offensive in Rafah just days after pulling out of the region. Hamas terrorists said that the new Israeli proposal for a ceasefire deal doesn't meet its demands, but added they will respond to the Egyptian and Qatari mediators. Meanwhile, the U.S. military said yesterday it destroyed air defense and drone systems of Yemen's Houthi forces in the Red Sea. There were no injuries or damage reported to commercial or U.S. ships. And continuing with our coverage of the six-month mark of the Israel-Hamas war, we have the second part of a special report. America's Hope host Kelly Wright was recently in Israel talking to the family members of hostages and others to hear how they're coping. Entity's Daniel Monahan has more. Yair Moses is the son of Margalit and Gadi Moses, who were both kidnapped from the kibbutz near Oz on the morning of October 7th. Hamas terrorists descended on the village, murdering and kidnapping its residents. His mom, Margalit, was freed from Gaza in late November, but his dad, Gadi Moses, is still being held captive. Yair shares his message with the world. 
Everyone must do whatever they can in order to have the, them released. This is the most important things, not to the, only the families, not only to Israel. It should be the number one priority for the whole world because once these people will be back home, even the war in Gaza will stop and everything will stop and will be different. Yair says his father has been a farmer for more than 60 years now. And for the past 35 years, he has been helping people in developing countries around the world learn how to improve their agriculture. He specializes in irrigation and soil, and he loves to show them, put his hands into the, into the land and show them exactly how the water in the soil and everything. And it doesn't matter if it's a group of professors from the university or kindergarten kids, he will talk with, on their level and explain them exactly that they will understand and make sure all questions are answered that everyone was satisfied. You are proud to be his son. Of course I am, of course no are. doubt about it, no doubt. He's an amazing you, man, amazing grandfather, amazing father, of course, and yes. And you want him home now? I want him home six months ago, but yes, yeah. Like many other family members of hostages, Yair says his life stopped on October 7th. I didn't work since October 7th. I focus only on doing activities to release them. I didn't shave, I don't wear this beard usually, I didn't cut my hair, and I'm focused only on bringing him home now. Prime Minister Netanyahu appointee Tal Gilboa's nephew is being held by Hamas. She says it's not enough to just bring the hostages home. She says Hamas must be defeated. We have to break Hamas. We don't want the Hamas will be next to our people because we can't take it anymore. Gilboa says no country would allow such an attack to happen to them. And everybody said, no, you have to, uh, to see that the civilians won't hurt, and you have to see that you're, you're, you're given in, uh, enough supply and aid. We're doing all these kind of things, but we want our people in Israel to be safe, and we want the hostages back. Gilboa discusses her nephew being held hostage. Guy is so shy and very modest. He loves to play music. It's like he was born with the soccer in his hands. He loved the Japanese culture. His biggest uh, dream was to be on April in Japan and to feel the Japanese culture and the cherry blossom. The Netanyahu appointee says they are putting all their prayer and energy into Guy to bring him strength and ensure his well-being. We want him back and we want him back alive and we want all his dreams to come true. NTD's Kelly Wright has been talking to hostage families, rabbis and pastors, Jewish and Arab people. The America's Hope Post has a special report on what he learned coming out in just a few weeks. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Former President Trump's hush money trial is set to begin with jury selection next Monday despite an attempt to delay it on Monday. Now, the New York Court of Appeals denied Trump's attorney's appeal to postpone the trial so it could consider whether to change the location. We turn now to our legal correspondent for the latest on this trial, as well as the Georgia and D.C. trials. Arlene, good to see you. Good to see you. Now, so Trump doesn't think he could have a fair uh, trial in Manhattan. What's the prosecution's response to that? pretty much said you waited too late. You should have brought this issue up earlier. And besides that, the jury selection will weed out any biased jurors. Now, the judge himself has already published the jury instructions as well as a 42-question questionnaire that will ask them questions like, um, did you ever attend a Trump rally? Or did you ever attend an anti-Trump rally? Do you have any opinions about whether or not a former president should be brought on trial for a crime? Things like that to, to kind of see who's biased. And also the jurors can ask to be excused from the trial. They can, and it could be for any reasons. It could be because they're biased and they can't be fair and impartial, or it could be because they have, you know, family obligations. Um, so these are the things that are doing to try and make it a fair trial. But Trump's attorneys have said that the majority of residents in Manhattan, based on some uh, demographic graphics they did, already believe that he's guilty. So there's going to be a little while, I think, to weed out those biased jurors. Right. And we're still waiting to hear the judge's ruling on motions about the gag order and one asking the judge to recuse himself. 
What's the status of those motions? So they challenged the gag order put on by the judge, and he limited, or he pretty much said, you can't make comments about any of the jurors or the witnesses or their families. And then he expanded it after Trump made a number of comments about the judge's daughter being involved with the Democratic Party and also working with the Biden campaign in 2020. And after that, he expanded it and said, you can't uh, make comments about the attorneys or their families, or you can't make comments about my family. So that's supposed to be heard by the appellate court uh, actually today. They're supposed to hear oral argument on that today. And then in the uh, recusal, um, they asked the judge to recuse himself because of his daughter's background. And actually, he heard a similar motion to this a little while ago, and he denied it, basically saying that his daughter has no personal involvement in this case, so there's no conflict of interest. Now, Arlene, in two other Trump cases, prosecutors are asking the courts to reject Trump's appeals. Um, so what's happening in the D.C. and Georgia cases here? So in D.C., um, the Trump appealed to the Supreme Court this presidential immunity issue. And yesterday, Monday, Jack Smith, the prosecutor, responded to that. And he's basically saying the opposite of what Trump's attorneys are saying. They're saying, you know, a president can't fully function in the office if he can't make certain decisions that may have to go outside of his executive power. You know, in times of emergency or war or something, he may have to make some decision, but he might hesitate on that if he feels like, oh, I could be prosecuted for this after I leave office. And Jack Smith's basically saying, um, you know, that has no, no bearing on what happens after you get out of office. You can fully function as a president, and it shouldn't matter, you know, what happens after you leave office. So that's kind of his argument against it. And then in the, uh, so the Supreme Court's going to hear about that, hear the oral argument on September 25th. And then in the Georgia case, uh, DA Fonnie Willis is objecting to the defendants appealing this disqualification order. That's the order that allows her to continue staying on this case. And she's basically saying, you couldn't prove it, you know, below. You didn't prove there was a conflict of interest. You weren't able to show that I was trying to benefit financially from this. So there's no reason for the appeals court to actually hear this case. So the appeals court has 45 days to either accept the decision below or to actually review the decision and maybe come up with a new decision. So we'll have to see what happens there. Certainly. We'll be looking forward to your next reports on this. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. And coming up, the House is proposing to renew a controversial spying power, but it seeks to reform how the power is carried out. Find out what privacy advocates are saying. The Treasury Department issues a warning over cryptocurrencies. It says bad actors such as Hamas and North Korea use them for illegal transactions. More in just a moment, here on NTD News Today. The shining gem of New England. This delightful seaside city of Newport is one of the most beautiful places in the state. Today we bring you here as we meet with our friends and fellow musicians from the Hermitage Piano Trio. As a team they have garnered multiple Grammy Award nominations with their breathtaking performances. Wow, I did not think this instrument can make that sound. Right? <laughs> the pandemic made this reunion even more special. The three of us, we like it because we feel music the same way, so... Don't miss us on the next episode of Piano Talks. Just young people, hungry, homeless, and vulnerable. 
Abused youth often feel safer on the street. Now, more than ever, that's the most dangerous place of all. Covenant House is helping young adults facing homelessness. We're providing safe shelter to thousands, but the need is overwhelming and no young person is ever turned away. Please call or go online now with your gift of $19 a month to help a young person. You'll provide safe shelter, hot meals, and medical care. Your gift will show them they're loved. Homeless young people are afraid and alone with nowhere else to turn. You want to know that there's somewhere you can go that's safe. So the Covenant House did that for us. Please call now with your gift of $19 a month. We'll send you this blanket as a reminder of the comfort your gift provides a young person tonight. Please don't wait. Your gift is the lifeline a young person needs now. Call the number on your screen or go online to safeplacetosleep.org. Thank you for saving precious lives. We're in the nation's capital asking the important questions so that you're in the know. Join us daily, Monday through Friday, on the Capitol Report on NTD News. Is it a crime to sleep in public? The Supreme Court is set to hear arguments on this soon. In Oregon, the city of Grants Pass want to curb homelessness, but a group of Democratic representatives, including Cori Bush and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, saying being homeless is not a crime. For insight, I spoke with Mark Miller, senior attorney with the Pacific Legal Foundation. Mark, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Now, why is it forbidden to punish homeless people camping out on the streets? Yeah, David, thank you for having me on. Uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which covers most of the western part of the United States, ruled in a series of cases, most recently a case called Johnson versus City of Grants Pass, that cities could not fine or arrest uh, homeless people if they were on public property. The court ruled that it would violate the cruel and unusual punishments clause of the Eighth Amendment, and the Supreme Court is going to hear arguments on whether the Ninth Circuit was correct later this spring, and actually just a few weeks on April 22nd. Now, so why are some lawmakers urging the Supreme Court to essentially block Oregon from prosecuting homeless people for sleeping outside? Well, it's very interesting. A number of legislators on, on both sides of the aisle weigh in on many important Supreme Court cases. For example, on pro-life cases, you will often see hundreds of Republican legislators file briefs urging the court to rule in favor of pro-life issues. Here, you see uh, Democrat legislators, Democrat congressmen and senators, arguing to the Supreme Court in what's called a friend of the court brief or an amicus brief that the homeless should not be ticketed or arrested for being homeless. They are trying to spin, if you will, the issue, which is really what the case is about. That spin, or whether you think it's accurate, which is that you're being arrested, these homeless people are being arrested for being homeless, as opposed to what the cities say, which is that they're just being fined or ticketed or maybe arrested for a minor infraction uh, not for being homeless, but rather for being on public property, for camping on public property, sleeping on public property, for creating the kinds of disasters we've seen all over the Western United States and some of the big cities, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Phoenix, and the like. Now, Mark, so are Oregon's actions considered a cruel and unusual punishment? Can you break down how this point fits into the argument here? Yeah, that's, you know, that's really the $64,000 question here, David, is, you know, the cruel and unusual punishments clause has generally been interpreted by the Supreme Court of the United States to only address the consequences for crimes. Is the consequence uh, cruel and unusual? For example, the Supreme Court ruled about 15, 16 years ago that a child a rapist could not be given the death penalty. Uh, that's a, a court case that many people want to challenge. But the court said there that they, it was cruel and unusual punishment to give that child rapist the death penalty, that that consequence, that punishment outweighed the crime. Now, whether or not you agree with that, you can at least see the logic that they were talking about a punishment for the crime. Here, what the homeless advocates are arguing is that 
the it's not so much about punishment. It's a but the eighth circuit, the eighth amendment can also be about whether you've committed a crime at all. They're saying that just the act of being homeless is not a crime. It's just a status. So what can local governments do within the law to make sure homeless camping, homeless encampments don't go out of hand? Well, that's that's really what the, the court is going to have to wrestle with. The governments are saying, the local and state governments, Gavin Newsom is, of course, supporting the government position here, which is a little unusual. He's lined up, opposed some of these Democrat legislators who filed that friend of the court brief we mentioned earlier. But they're saying, look, the court should have nothing to do with deciding how cities, how the executive branch and the legislative branch deal with the homeless problem. That that has nothing to do with the Constitution, that it has to do with how government regulates uh, public property. All right, Mark, thank you so much for your insight and for being with us. Thank you, David. Family and friends of the victims of the Baltimore Bridge collapse held a prayer service and a candlelight procession yesterday. The six victims of the bridge collapse were all immigrants from Mexico and Central America. They were repairing potholes on the road surface of the bridge when it collapsed. During the procession, people carried six crucifixes bearing the names of the victims and the flags of the countries they came from. The container ship Dolly struck a pylon of the bridge after a power failure, causing the entire structure to crumble into the water within seconds. And Maryland Governor Wes Moore said yesterday he plans to address Congress on support for rebuilding the Francis Scott Key Bridge. He plans to emphasize the economic impact of the port. The governor called it an opportunity to support a port that's directly responsible for the hiring of tens of thousands of people. Emergency legislation to aid port employees was recently approved and it's awaiting Moore's signature. Moore underscored the ongoing efforts to support affected families and recover the remaining victims. A Louisiana bill called the Women's Safety Protection Act advanced out of a state house committee yesterday. The bill would limit the use of restrooms, locker rooms, and sleeping quarters to men or women. It would not allow exceptions for people who say they identify as another gender. The bill would apply to facilities including public schools, jails, and domestic violence shelters. Opponents say the bill would put those who identify as another gender at increased risk of harassment. Supporters of the measure say it was created to protect women and girls from sexual assault and harassment. The bill passed out of a bipartisan House committee without objection. It will now head to the Republican-dominated House floor next week for debate. Republican lawmakers in New York State are now going against so-called squatters. They've introduced a bill that would make it easier for landlords to remove people occupying their property without permission. The New York bill is similar to a law recently passed in Florida. It would shift the burden of proof from the owner to the person occupying the residence. The squatter would have to prove that they have the right to be on the property. Right now, any person who's occupying a New York property for more than 30 days is considered a tenant, even if they never signed a lease or paid rent. The bill would change that to 45 days. And a California activist group is paying high school students $1,400 each to become racial and social justice activists. That's according to contracts between the group and the Long Beach Unified School District. The school district used nearly $2 million in taxpayer funds from 2019 to 2023 to pay a group called Californians for Justice. News outlet The Free Press reported the money was used for equity and diversity leadership training for students and teachers. The group's website says it advocated for implementing restorative justice practices in the district's 84 schools. The group gave a one-time stipend of $1,400 to 78 students who participated in the group's programs and gave out over $20,000 to 13 parents who participated in the program from 2019 to 2024. The website also states its leadership development programs operate with a focus on low-income youth, youth of color, LGBT youth, foster youth, and immigrant youth. Lawmakers will move forward today with a proposal to reauthorize a controversial spying power. It has ignited sharp disputes about government overreach and privacy protections. Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act allows officials to gather information on foreign actors working outside the U.S. 
A House bill aims to reauthorize the power but reform its controversial part. In 2021, it was discovered that 3.3 million queries on Americans were made under Section 702. The same mechanism was used to spy on former President Trump's 2016 campaign. The Crossfire Hurricane investigation was based on the allegation that Trump's campaign was working with Russia, which was later proven false. Section 702 has also been improperly used on political campaign donors, January 6 protesters, and Black Lives Matter protesters. In response to these abuses, the reauthorization bill would implement safeguards, but privacy advocates feel the new bill still lacks the necessary protections. The Treasury Department is calling for more regulation over cryptocurrency. The department warned yesterday that terrorists use cryptocurrencies to hide their identities and move assets, and state actors like Russia use virtual currency to finance the war in Ukraine. Deputy Secretary Wally Adeyemo wants Congress to approve new regulatory tools for digital assets. He says terror groups like Al-Qaeda and Hamas use them for their own benefit, and state actors like Russia and North Korea use them to circumvent sanctions. Adeyemo says the Treasury needs stronger tools to go after such actors. He mentioned secondary sanctions targeting foreign cryptocurrencies that enable illicit finance. An update in the Hunter Biden tax evasion case. The judge has ruled there were problems in Biden's request to submit more material to support his arguments to dismiss the case. The judge says the first son's approach had multiple shortcomings. In addition to submitting the filing late, those include failing to schedule a hearing for the motion, not outlining the legal standard, and failing to justify the need for supplemental material. The judge also says Hunter Biden had the chance to present arguments during a three-hour hearing, but failed to do so adequately. Ultimately, the judge stated that submitting further materials would not change the decision to deny the motions. Hunter Biden's legal team had previously submitted eight motions to dismiss, arguing political pressure and immunity from a previous plea deal. They were all rejected. And next up, Top Gun Maverick does not plagiarize, the court has ruled. It dismissed a lawsuit against Paramount Pictures over the film that took in $1.5 billion worldwide after its 2022 release. A 1983 magazine article inspired the original Top Gun film. It's about the U.S. Navy's fighter pilot training school in San Diego. The author's widow and son said they deserved some of the blockbuster sequel's profits, but a judge on Friday said the movie was not substantially similar in the article and that Copyright doesn't cover factual elements. Their lawyer said they will appeal. The judge also said Paramount was not required to credit the author in the sequel as it had in the original Top Gun movie, even though in 2020 the family ended Paramount's exclusive movie rights to his article. Up ahead, UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron travels to Mar-a-Lago in Florida for a meeting with former President Trump what the pair discussed, and more. President Biden is hosting the leaders of Japan and the Philippines this week. Details of the historic trilateral meeting between Washington and its Asian allies. More shortly, here on NTE News Today. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I pray to you today to guide us tomorrow. Give us strength as we face death. Help us not to be afraid, as we know that we are going to be coming to your people. Hillsdale College is reaching and teaching millions of Americans to pursue truth and defend liberty. But to do that in an even bigger way, we need your help. 
Your generous support helps educate students from kindergarten to college, all while refusing every penny of government funding, even indirect funding like student loans or grants. And your dedicated giving allows us to teach millions of Americans through our free online courses. You make all the difference. Give a gift today. Just use this link. <laughs> My baby's back from the West Coast. <laughs> Hear those pictures that you asked for for your school project? First day of school, cute as a button. <laughs> <laughs> so long ago. Oh, here's Grandma Florence after that flood wiped out the whole neighborhood. Sometimes I just cannot believe all the storms we've gone through here. I can only hope that we'll be able to leave this house to you one day, baby. You're our legacy. Planning for these disasters will make sure we're safe. And it's the best way to protect that legacy. Ah, those <laughs> beans smell heavenly. Mm -hmm. Give Mom a little credit. You know what? We should make an emergency communication plan. That way we're ready this year. Oh, Great idea. At my dorm, we have emergency kits for earthquakes and wildfires, but I'm sure there's something more local I can send you with the link. Okay. Smart. I'm coming to share with you guys. Protect your legacy. Plan for natural disasters today. Visit ready.gov forward slash plan. The 2024 NTD Night International Chinese Vocal Competition is scheduled to take place at Merkin Hall Kaufman Music Center in New York from September 18th to 21st. The competition specially invites vocalists from the world-famous Shenyun Performing Arts to serve as judges. The prestigious gold award is $10,000. Yeah. Chinese vocal artists aged 18 to 50 are welcome to register. Hi, I'm Kelly Wright. We thank you for joining us and watching America's Hope here on NTD News. Bottom line is, I know you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, but let's give you some good news in the midst of the bad news. Watch us nightly right here on NTD News for a full dose of America's Hope. Welcome back. UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron met with former President Trump at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida. The pair yesterday discussed Ukraine and Gaza and other issues. The meeting is believed to be Trump's first with a senior British minister since leaving office. Cameron heads to Washington today. He plans to meet Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other political leaders to discuss Ukraine aid. Cameron's office says he will urge the approval of an extra $60 billion in supplementary funding earmarked for Ukraine, currently under consideration in Congress. Trump has previously declared that he would end the Ukraine war within days of being back in the White House. President Biden is hosting the leaders of Japan and the Philippines this week. The allies seek to boost economic and defense ties to offset China's growing power in the region. Biden's summit with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida on Wednesday will bring an upgrade in defense ties with Japan. Then on Thursday, Kishida will become the second Japanese leader to address a joint meeting of Congress. His predecessor gave a speech in 2015. Biden will also hold a meeting with Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos on Thursday. Last year, Marcos and Biden joined Kishida for a trilateral summit that focused on the South China Sea. Other issues on the agenda this year include managing risks from North Korea and the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. And now for a shift in gears, we have some short headlines from Germany and other European countries. Ukraine has to import energy as Russia keeps attacking power plants. Kyiv says Russia used almost 400 missiles and attack drones in a single week late, late March. This reportedly cut off electricity, heating, and even running water to 2 million Ukrainians. Russia says the energy system is a legitimate military target. Moscow described its attacks as revenge strikes for Ukraine's attacks on border regions. Ukraine now depends on quick repairs, like the one we're seeing here, where people in protective suits and hard hats worked at a site impacted by an airstrike. Germany's agriculture minister today said he welcomes an agreement on restrictions on Ukrainian food imports. Farmers across the continent have protested cheap imports from Ukraine, which they say undercut prices. The European Union dropped tariffs at the beginning of the war to support Ukraine's economy. EU lawmakers on Monday said they reached a deal on new curbs. 
This will still require approval from other EU members and the European Parliament. And flood sirens blared out in two Russian cities today, warning thousands more to evacuate immediately. This amid the worst flooding in at least 70 years. Parts of the Russian city of Orenburg may be flooded in the next 24 hours. That's as water levels in two major rivers are set to keep rising. Melting snow across the Ural Mountains in Siberia has swelled the rivers. Over 10,000 homes have been flooded so far and thousands more are at risk. European countries today signed an agreement to protect underwater infrastructure in the North Sea. Six nations say the joint declaration would allow them to share information. Threats to undersea cables and pipelines have become a concern for European countries. In September 2022, explosions damaged the Nord Stream pipelines built to deliver gas from Russia to Germany. Today's agreement includes protecting infrastructure from possible Russian attacks. And a visa policy raising espionage concerns. Two Republican lawmakers are urging the Biden administration to end what they call a visa loophole. It's a 2009 policy that allows Chinese nationals to enter the Northern Mariana Islands, a U.S. territory, without a visa for two weeks. The concern is, from there, they may be able to enter Guam, home to two U.S. military bases. The two territories are a little over 120 miles apart. Senator Joni Ernst and Congressman Neil Dunn say this could allow Chinese spies to access U.S. military installations. Ernst told the New York Post that the U.S. must change this visa policy. This comes as a rising number of Chinese nationals are found near sensitive U.S. sites. An illegal Chinese immigrant was arrested this March for breaching a U.S. military base. Chinese nationals have also been caught scuba diving near U.S. rocket launch sites and snapping photos of White House communication gear and guard positions. The Department of Homeland Security has defended the visa policy, saying that no visitor can travel to other parts of the U.S. from the Northern Marianas, including Guam, without a visa. Germany's top corporate brass is joining Chancellor Olaf Scholz when he visits China later this month. Among the big names, the CEO of Siemens, Mercedes-Benz, and semiconductor chemicals maker Merck KGAA. Despite Germany pushing for a strategy to de-risk from China, the communist country remains its largest trading partner. Last year, German direct investment into China hit a record high, $12.9 billion, an over 4% increase from the previous year. Some of Germany's biggest firms, such as chemical giants BASF and automaker Volkswagen, still bank on China as a growth motor, though a number of smaller firms have started to change track taking steps to legally separate their Chinese businesses. Coming up in college basketball, UConn tops Purdue for their second straight national championship. NTD's Dave Martin joins us to discuss the win. Banging pots to scare away a sun-eating Native American legend and a mid-air proposal, the unique reactions and experiences of those viewing the solar eclipse and one of Canada's leading Hot Wheels experts boasts a collection of 25,000 toy cars. For this collector, the hobby is about passion, not record breaking. More in just a moment here on NTD News Today. I have never seen a production any better than this anywhere. Breathtaking. It is absolutely stunning. I feel better about the world. I feel uplifted. Invigorating. It was encouraging. Gave me hope. This has just been therapy for the soul. It's a must see. Must see. Make sure you see it. Make sure you see it. Coming to Lincoln Center, NJ Pack, State Theater, Purchase, and Stamford. Genuine.com. Say goodbye to harsh, bitter coffee and hello to a delicious, smooth brew. With specialty quality beans expertly roasted in-house, you'll taste the difference with every sip. Fermented with a blend of 50 enzymes, Day's Coffee delivers a rich brew like no other. 
made with the highest grade specialty beans available, you're sure to taste the difference. Elevate your morning with Day's Enzyme Fermented Coffee. How'd it happen? She showed up dead on arrival. This never gets easier. It does when you call Car Shield before your car breaks down. Look at these prices. The camshaft, transmission, engine. Don't people know? A plan through Car Shield could protect up to 5,000 parts and systems. Yay to see it. An out of warranty car is going to break down eventually. Right, which is why they need a plan through Car Shield. Those expensive repair bills get paid and at the mechanic of their choice. They're notifying the family. Poor guy, he doesn't even know what's coming. Another victim of senselessly expensive repair bills. Can't save them all. But we can keep trying. Mm. Didn't have to end this way. If he'd have just called Car Shield before his car broke down. <sighs> exactly. Protect yourself from the unprecedented rise in costs for parts and repairs. Call now to save money with your price lock guarantee. Call 800-429-5128. Life doesn't always give you time to change the outcome. Prediabetes does. One in three adults has prediabetes, but with early diagnosis, prediabetes can be reversed. And you can change the outcome. Take the one minute prediabetes risk test today. Go to doihaveprediabetes.org. For the day's top headlines and the news you need to know, tune in right here to NTD Evening News. And now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, good to see you. So last, night, last night's game in college basketball, UConn won their second straight national title. So what are some things that stood out to you for the key, the key to their win? Yeah, I thought UConn being able to defend Zach Eady mostly without double teaming him was really huge for them. Uh, you know, Donovan, UConn's Donovan Klingon eventually got into foul trouble doing so, but they didn't let Purdue's perimeter players get any good looks at the rim, you know, in turn from doing that. So it was really a one-man show for Purdue. And although Eady is a two-time player of the year, he looked tired before halftime. I don't think he blocked a shot the entire second half. And then somehow the Huskies collected 14 offensive rebounds despite him filling up the lane. I mean, he's 7'4", four, he three, weighs 300 pounds. Um, so Edie eventually got Klingon and his backup, Sanson Johnson, into foul trouble. So they did have to double team him a bit, but the double team happened so quickly. UConn was still able to get back out and defend the perimeter players, so they were really good on defense. So it was a close game in the first half. It sort of turned into a rout after halftime, and now they're the two-time defending champions. And in the women's game, the TV audience for Sunday's championship game was nearly 19 million viewers. That's a women's record for sure. What do you think is the reason that this has become so popular? You know, I... I think for sure it has to be Caitlin Clark. I mean, each of her last three games that she played broke a TV record. I mean, that was against LSU, UConn, and then against South Carolina there in the championship game. This one, though, drew a bigger TV audience than any basketball game, that's men's or women's, college or pro, since 2019. Plus, we'll have to see what the ratings the men got, but this could be the first time the women get higher ratings for the championship game than the men's do. Now, we already saw that tickets for the women's Final Four were selling for like twice what the men's were, so that wouldn't surprise me, of course. I also think it'll be interesting to see if these ratings hold up next year for women's college basketball and what happens when Clark come to, comes to the WNBA. Do they see similar ratings? So something to watch for in the next year, anyway. All right, Dave, so staying in college sports, the NAIA just announced a transgender athlete policy change that prevents uh, men from participating in women's sports. Will the NCAA do the same thing? It doesn't seem like it. I mean, they released a statement saying they'll, quote, 
make unprecedented investments in women's sports and ensure fair competition for all student athletes in all NCAA championships. Now, they don't exactly say how they'll do that, though, and they're already facing a lawsuit from more than a dozen former athletes accusing them of violating their Title IX rights by allowing former transgender Leah Thomas to compete in the national championships. And that includes Riley Gaines, who described in very emotional detail having to share a locker room with Thomas, a biological male, whose rating incidentally jumped from the 500s in the men's division to first uh, in the women's. Now, the interesting thing is the NAIA also said all athletes can play in men's sports, but only biological fem females who haven't begun hormone therapy can play in women's. I also think it's interesting to note there's really never been any problem with biological females, of course, in men's sports that, that I've heard about anyway. Yeah, that sounds about right to me as well. Um, usually it's the other way around that you hear about. Yeah, exactly. Well, I look forward to hearing more on all of these. Thank you so much, Dave, as always. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Dave. And next up, crowds across North America gazed upward at a blackened sun during the midday dusk yesterday. They celebrated with cheers, music, and even by getting married for the first total solar eclipse on the continent in seven years. Entity's Daniel Monahan has their reactions. Crowds gathered at a Benedictine monastery in Erie, Pennsylvania to watch the solar eclipse. The Benedictine Sisters of Erie held the viewing and offered free solar eclipse glasses for guests on the property. Sister Linda Romy called it a once-in-a-lifetime experience. It really was miraculous that the sky cleared just before the eclipse started. The moon started moving over and we got to watch the whole thing. And 11-year-old Jace Bruno was truly impressed. Just seeing like the circle around it was, I don't know how to describe it, it's just, it was so cool. Passengers aboard a Delta Airlines plane had a once-in-a-lifetime viewing party unlike any other, riding the solar eclipse's path of totality. Taking off from Austin, Texas, the flight hovered 30,000 feet above ground, carrying a sold-out cabin filled with excited eclipse enthusiasts before landing in Detroit. Weather and clouds were no factors for travelers as the eclipse entered totality in clear view through passenger windows. Absolutely amazing. The best flight I've ever taken with Delta. It was incredible. I got to see the wonderful, beautiful eclipse. I got to see the moment of totality. Well, we spent a lot of time drawing on a drawing board and coming up with our plan, and uh, we went into the simulator and uh, experimented a few times. This eclipse enthusiast used the rare event to propose to his beloved. A once-in-a-lifetime experience, so it just seemed like perfect to combine it. In the small town of Millerton, Oklahoma, dozens of eclipse chasers watched nervously as clouds covered the skyline in the morning. But a break in clouds gave way to a stunning full total solar eclipse. During totality, people banged on pots and pans to scare away Funilusa, the black squirrel that Choctaw legend says is eating away at the sun during the eclipse. Creation itself declares there's a god. And we just saw it. In Cleveland, Ohio, cheers erupted on opening day at Progressive Field as the crowd watched the moon cover the sun. It's pretty wild. You know, I saw things on the news, they were talking about it being celestial and things like that. But as you experience it, it feels kind of weird like that. I thought it was kind of hokey when they were talking about it, but then as it happened, then, you know, it was kind of neat. The next total solar eclipse will occur on August 12, 2026, visible in Greenland, Iceland, Spain, Russia, and a small portion of Portugal. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Based on recent Google searches, it seems some may have taken in yesterday's solar eclipse without the proper equipment. Many people searched, why do my eyes hurt, showing a possible lack of awareness about eye safety during eclipses. Searches for the term peaked between 3 and 4 in the afternoon, just as the eclipse crossed the country. While interest decreased after the eclipse ended, current search volumes still surpassed recent levels. Some memes on social media took shots at those who perhaps ignored the safety measures. One of Canada's leading Hot Wheels experts has amassed a huge collection over 40 years. Now he's looking for space to showcase the popular toy cars. Entity's Andrew Thomas has more on the story behind The Collector.
manageable in a rainbow. And Doug Woods uh, was four when he scored this tiny 1969 Volkswagen Beach Bomb Hot Wheel at a yard sale for just 10 cents. He never imagined he would own 25,000 Hot Wheel cars and parts today. Car that's near and dear to me because uh, this was actually one of our uh, wedding cars. We had uh, them done as wedding favors. So these were on the tables at each placing and uh, at the table, and we used these on our wedding. In February, Woods displayed his rarest vehicles at the Canadian International Auto Show. His six-year-old daughter is his dedicated collecting partner. My family's been really supportive of my hobby, although it's uh, an interesting one. It uh, has garnered a lot of friendships over the years worldwide. American Mike Zarnock has held the record for the world's largest Hot Wheels collection since 2003, with some 30,000 cars. But for Woods, it's not about breaking the record. I just enjoy the hobby and uh, I've accumulated cars over the past uh, over 40 years of, um, of collecting. And I just enjoy uh, the cars, I enjoy the stories, I enjoy the ecosystem that is Hot Wheels collecting. According to the last Mattel annual report, Hot Wheels raked in $617.9 million in sales in North America in 2022. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And before we wrap up our show, breaking news. The parents of the teenager responsible for a school shooting in Oxford, Michigan that killed four students in 2021 have been sentenced to prison. Each of them received a sentence of 10 to 15 years after being convicted of manslaughter. Jennifer and James Crumbly are the first parents convicted in a U.S. school shooting. Ethan Crumbly, now 17, is serving a life sentence for murder and other crimes. For more details, be sure to stick around for NTD Newsroom at 3 p.m. Eastern. And for Round the Clock original news coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. There are real consequences to controlled media. And NTD's founders know them firsthand. Our freedom of thought is the price. This is the lesson that guides us in everything we do. So there's the tear gas there. We know the value of a free society. And we take seriously the responsibility to preserve it. We are NTD.